Right. right. Well, it's got it, it. Back then, it was just the the, the, the shield, and then whatever center color okay, didn't matter. They, they weren't standard colored. The shield that went on the outside, and then the middle wire. Yep, we have the center. Uh, where is the? Of course, we're alive. Wait, you can hear us right now.
Hello, hello. Test, test. Huh? Okay. I don't speak Asian. I don't speak, I only speak English and Spanish. That was English. From English. Kind of English. Oh, yeah. That's not British either. Well, yeah, but you, they don't really hear it. Oh, snap comment. Test, test, test. One, two, three. Test, 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 one, two, three. Test, 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 one, two, three. Test, Shayla, Shayla. Test, mic on. Yes, no, maybe so. Test, test, maybe so. Strong coffee, hmm. Strong coffee sounds good. <laughs> Nate, did we'll you get it?
Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to call today's meeting to order for open session for our board meeting on Tuesday, June 13th, 2023 at 6.02 p.m. Leading us this evening in the ple Pledge of Allegiance, we have a student, Stella Halloween. Would you kindly uh, lead us? Thank you. Um, put your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, MJ, will you be... Um, Yes, letting us know about the essay contest winner, winners. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> we all heard it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm MJ Noor. I'm the founder and president of the Parents Voice USA. The organization actually started out here in the Fullerton School District in 2009. We're really excited to be here this evening. The Parents Voice is founded on empowering parents and, of course, supporting education. Let me begin maybe by extending our congratulations to the teachers in this district for awakening and nurturing the writing skills of students and to recognize Dr. Pletka and his distinguished school board for creating the environment for teachers and students to excel. This year, we extended an essay competition to eighth graders. The essays drew over 100 or approximately 100 applicants. Some, I have to say, were extraordinary, to the point that it was very, very difficult for us to select. Our first two winners, the first and second places, were awarded the uh, certificates at their graduation. However, Stella Halloween from La Dera Vista, we did not have the opportunity to extend her uh, congratulations, and that's what we're doing here tonight. So tonight we're congratulating our third place winner from La Dera Vista Junior High, who presented an extremely moving essay. Stella, could you join me and maybe read your essay? It's brief but powerful. This is Stella Halloween. Um, my essay is called All Stars Burn Out Eventually. How does one define a hero? Is it a firefighter saving a cat from a tree? A prince saving a damsel or a superhero defeating the bad guy? Hero is a word we use so much but we'll never understand its full meaning. Like a wave on the shore, this person came back to me and the answer to this became clear. My hero is my grandma or my oma. At only 18, she left her family in Germany behind to start over with her new American husband. With two kids by 20, my Oma learned how to survive on her own with little help with my grandpa. When they divorced, she had nothing but her willpower. By the skin of her teeth, she raised my mom and aunt, teaching them to be strong as well. Throughout her life, she struggled with 
depression and the effects of that, but nobody ever saw that side of her. She kept up a wall. She needed to stay for her three daughters and wanted to see her grandchildren grow up. When I was in kindergarten, my dad's mom died. That night, my Oma took me into her backyard and showed me the stars. She told me that nobody ever truly leaves and to look to the stars if I missed my Nana. Over the seven and a half years of my life, my Oma showed me nothing but love. She would console me if I cried, but help me through it and teach me a lesson. She was a truly kind person, and to seven-year-old me, she was my bright star, but I know now all stars burn out eventually. In April of 2016, my grandma lost her battle with depression and took her own life. My family has a history of mental illness, but I decided I wasn't going to be the same. When I was diagnosed with ADHD, depression came with it, and when I think about suicide, I remember my Oma. I remember the strength she had to stay until she had done what she needed to do. She raised three beautiful daughters and lived to see her two grandchildren grow to be seven and nine. I see her strength in the fireflies' bright light, I see her spirit in the ocean waves, and I see her love in how I live my life today. That is what a hero is. That is who my hero is. She doesn't save kittens, damsels, or cities. My Oma shows me how to live with strength, love, and compassion. She shows me how to stay. She shows me what I have left. And though I couldn't save her, I can save myself. She is my hero. I, um, that was our third place winner. Let me, uh, let me just say this. Your school system is beautiful. Your teachers are beyond what I would think parents really understand. You have great facilities, great teachers, and a great board. It's very important that parents in this district know that. Also want to just give you a little tidbit on the Parents' Voice. The Parents' Voice last year put on an event called Black Holes, and we brought a distinguished professor in to speak. This year in October, we plan on doing another event, and this will be artificial intelligence in the education system. It's going to be probably October the 5th. It'll be Thursday night. And guess what? All our events are free. All our events are free. All our services are free. And if any parent needs any assistance whatsoever, you contact us on the Parents Voice USA. At this point, I'd like to award Stella with some certificates. I'm sorry, can you come back maybe? <laughs> this is, um, I know you're going to high school. This might help you out with some clothes or some <laughs> exciting things. Here's your third place certificate for your distinguished essay certificate. We have also a certificate from our legislature from Sharon Quirk Silva, uh, who's extremely proud of your accomplishments and achievements, and also from Congress, from Michelle Steele. Thank you. Stella, you have a bright future ahead of you. Thank you. I wish you great success, and always remember the Fullerton School District. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you very much, and congratulations. Um, for anyone that just arrived, uh, there will be orange forms over in the back corner for public comment. If you'd like to fill one out, and you can present it to Anna. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I? The front two rows are the parents' voice, and some of them are their executive board member. If I could ask them to stand, because they all came out from different areas to come here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you so much. Uh, Jeremy, 
for our next item, the uh, Media Festival Award winners, please. Great. All right. Um, uh, some of you may know we have our, our annual FSD Fest um, every year, and we do a large film festival. Uh, and we encouraged um, our students uh, that submitted to the film festival to also submit to the California Student Media Festival. So the California Student Media Festival has been going on uh, for over 20 years. Um, and it's a huge festival for all of California, for anyone who wants to submit a video um, and potentially uh, have a winning video. So we had two finalists uh, who turned into um, wonderful winners. Uh, one of them is here tonight. We'll be presenting a plaque in just a moment. Um, but we had one from Hermosa, and that was Ethan uh, Arona. And then we had one from Sunset Lane, and that is... Um, I am so sorry for what I'm about to do to your last name. I am so sorry, Grayson. Um, Grayson Yamachika. Is that right? Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> so Grayson's here. If we can give him a round of applause, we're going to give him a plaque in just a moment. Um, uh, but Grayson, this is this is two years in a row uh, that Grayson has actually been one of our award winners. Um, he, he he was this amazing cook. If any of you remember from last year, um, he had the most amazing smile as he prepared his dish, um, and it was wonderful. But then he went a whole new route. So even though I really... La that was a cooking show, but I think also a comedy. I don't know, Grayson, would you call it a comedy or a cooking show or both? Both. Excellent. Okay, loved it. Total different this year. So um, so this is called uh, Haya. Grayson, can you say his name? You'll do it better than I am. Okay. So Hayao Miyazaki, the master of Japanese animation. So we'll take a moment and we'll watch the film and then we'll present Grayson with his plaque. Hayao Miyazaki, the master of Japanese animation. Hayao Miyazaki was born in Tokyo, Japan on January 5th, 1941. His father, Katsuji Miyazaki, was the director of Miyazaki Airplane Company. The company made Japanese Zero fighter plane parts during World War II. Hayao loved aviation and would later name his studio after an Italian play, Caproni CA-309 Ghibli. The war caused Miyazaki and his family to evacuate. The bombings and the war affected him deeply. He and his mom were often sick. Miyazaki spent a lot of time reading manga, or Japanese comic and drawing. He wanted to become a manga artist and his interest in animation grew after watching Panda and the Magic Serpent. After graduating from university, Miyazaki worked at Toei Animation and Nippon Animation. In 1985, Studio Ghibli was co-founded by Hayao Miyazaki, Isayo Takahata, and Toshio Suzuki. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind was a great success and the film brought attention to Miyazaki. The film is about a brave princess, Nausicaa, who tries to prevent two nations from war and to restore harmony between humans, insects, and nature. My neighbor Totoro is about two sisters, Sasuke and Mei, and their dad who move into an old house to be closer to the hospital where their mother is recovering from illness. They are the only ones who can see house spirits, Totoro and the cat bus. This is a fun and heartfelt film for all. <laughs> Princess Mononoke, the last Imishi prince, Ashitaka, is cursed by a scary demon and is looking for a great four spirit. A deer like God by day, at night it turns into a giant night walker. Spirited Away is a story about a little girl named Hiro. She is forced to work in the spirit bathhouse. After her parents are turned into pigs, she meets Haku, the boy who changes into a dragon, and No Face, who follows her because she is lonely. Ponyo is about a magical goldfish named Brunhilda, who meets and befriends a little boy named Sosuke. He gives her the name Ponyo. She wishes to become a human. Ponyo's dad, who was once human, thinks she is kidnapped and uses his magic to find her. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you for watching.
Okay, so um, two total films. One, one was for elementary aesthetic, and that was fiction. That was a, a film called Homework in a Nutshell. Uh, that was by uh, Ethan from Hermosa. And then um, Grayson won for elementary academic nonfiction finalists. So um, there's a plaque over there for him. There's also a plaque going to Sunset Lane that they can mount. Uh, and an award of $750 went to Sunset Lane as well to further uh, their film and their arts over there. So Grayson, if you want to go on up, Miss Anna has a plaque and, <laughs> and a poster for you. All right. <laughs> And I believe there's a cupcake or two as well. <laughs> All right, we are looking forward to many more films each year from Mr. Grace, and we hope he keeps it up. Because um, if, if as a uh, last year, I think it was our youngest ever to submit and win. Um, so I think we have many more years of films uh, coming from Grace, and so we're excited for that. All right, thanks, Grace, and we appreciate you. In brief, if anybody would like to submit a public comment form, uh, please feel free to do so. Anna has the forms there in the back corner. Thank you so much. All right, um, moving on to section three, do we, oh. Sure. We don't have any regular public comments. Okay. Oh, all right. Um, do we want to um, begin our report section right now, or do we want to maybe go ahead and go to our presentations and move the agenda around? Colleagues? agenda around and do our presentations because we have staff here that would prefer that. Okay. I'm in agreement. Do we have a, maybe a different order that we'd like to go in then? So are we saying the two presentations on LCAP and budget or? Yes, yes please. Yes, exactly. Those are the two for which there's public comment too. Right. They're, they're public hearing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so because these are public hearings, we're actually going to um, close the public meeting and then reopen for these public hearings and then the presentations and public comments. All right, colleagues? Okay. okay. All right, so in that time, I'm, in that case, I'm gonna go ahead and adjourn um, our, our meeting tonight at 6.20, and I'm going to uh, reopen for our public hearing also at 6.20 for the proposed 2023-2024 LCAP, or Local Control and Accountability Plan. And so I now declare a public hearing um, to allow for public comment regarding the proposed 2023-2024 Local Control Accountability Plan. I'll read this brief statement regarding our public comments. The board meeting follows rules of decorum per board bylaw 9323 Individual speakers shall be allowed three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item. The board limits the total time for public input on each item to 20 minutes. The total time allowed for public comment shall be 30 minutes. Um, the board can adjust that time if necessary. Public comments about an item that is on the agenda will be heard at the time the agenda item is considered by the board. Public comments about an item that is not on the posted agenda will be heard at the beginning of open session when called upon by the board president. No action or discussion may take place on an item that is not on the posted agenda, except as expressly authorized by law. Since the board cannot take action on items that are not on the agenda, such items will be referred to the superintendent for handling. Board members may request that any item be placed on a future agenda for further discussion. The board president and superintendent will be determine the best time to place an item on the agenda. Persons wishing to address the board are invited to complete and submit a request to speak slip to the executive assistant. These slips are available at the entrance of the room. Uh, we do have public comments, and so I'd like to go ahead and begin uh, in the order that they were filled out. 
Stephen Miyamoto, Miyamoto, would you please come to the podium? Hello, my name is Steve Miyamoto. I have a public comment about the, the plan. I noticed goal four was regarding parent involvement. So this current past year, I have two kids in the Fullerton School District. One of them found a sexually inappropriate book in her classroom. We reported it in private. I, was t I told um, the administration, the school administration, I don't want our identity known, but you might want to check this book out to protect the school and the classmates. We were told this, the book was removed. Later we found out the book was still there and the teacher retaliated against my daughter, ripping out of her hands and saying, you told your daughter to report this. She found much hostility in the class. She, I think she, she told me she was the only person in the class not to get an award that year, last year. So my concern is this. The book was sexually inappropriate. The publisher says it is not for that grade. It's for a few grades higher. When the principal first talked to me about it, saying the book was removed, she said that it was um, the rest of the political part of the book was acceptable, which you know, some parents, I think, would, be, would have no problems with a trans agenda. Other people, other parents would be very upset. In any case, the book was too young. My daughter's in the fourth grade to be exposed to sexual activity between two naked people in bed. So my concern is this, how do, we know, how do we know if, in such a case, if the, the principal or the teacher is having this book there against the parents' wishes? Because the, teacher, the principal made it clear to me, if not for that one page of the sexual activity, the book would be acceptable. I mean, I, I'm kind of uncomfortable having any political agenda brought in, regardless either side, and, my, and to expose my young kids to it. So I think I saw that the measure of success for goal four here, but I don't feel it gives the parents any, like, my daughter told me, I told the principal that the kids are having inappropriate conversations about this, but yet no parent was told. So if no parent's told, how can they have input? Still, most of those parents don't know their kids were exposed to this or they were having inappropriate conversations. So I think some mechanism should be involved with this that would address that or a recourse for the parents to know what's going on and uh, have some input into the things the kids are exposed to. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Hammett, that sounds like that issue was both reg regarding LCAP but also a very specific issue. If you and the team haven't already, can you please follow up with Mr. Miyamoto? Yes. Thank you. Also, uh, Jeremy, are you um, keeping track of time for us, please? Yeah. Oh, you are? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, our next public comment, Karen Yingling. Um, good evening. I'm Karen Yingling. I'm a longtime parent in Fullerton School District. I am also an educational advocate for students with disabilities. I'm offering comment on goal three, action number five, and specifically the proposal to put security officers that are otherwise known as SROs in our elementary school campuses. On March 25th, 2015, police officers violently arrested a citizen. The police grabbed her by the ankles and dragged her. She was lying face down on the ground, handcuffed, with her face pressed so closely to the ground, she was having difficulty breathing. An officer kneeling on top of her, pinning her down with his knee squarely in her back. Several other officers, as well as school administrators, stood around the scene watching. She was crying and yelling, help, I'm hurting. The handcuffed individual was a black 10-year-old child who has been diagnosed with autism. In Virginia, a black 11-year-old boy diagnosed with autism was charged with disorderly conduct and felony assault of a police officer for his act of kicking over a trash can in school and trying to pull away when a school resource officer grabbed him. He was handcuffed, arrested, and put in the back of a police car. In Kenton, Kentucky, a third grader with ADHD was arrested by an SRO officer after having a severe outburst. When he refused to follow the SRO's orders to sit down, he was handcuffed for 15 minutes. 
The handcuffs were placed around his elbows, pinning his arms behind his back, even though the eight-year-old boy cried out in pain. I could spend my entire three minutes and several more hours talking about other cases like this with black and brown students and students with disabilities being victims of SRO violence. But I don't have to keep talking about it because the Department of Education does it for me. Every year, every other year actually, the Department of Education collects and eventually releases to the public data that shows the number of student referrals and arrests made by police and SROs. The data includes students' ages, genders, race, and whether they have a disability. The data consistently shows students of color and students with disabilities are disproportionately referred to and arrested by police in school. The Department of Ed statistics show that students with disabilities represent a quarter of the students who are referred to law enforcement or subject to school-related arrest while representing just under 12% of the population. Students with disabilities were also nearly three times more likely to be arrested than students without disabilities. This is not a risk we should be willing to take in this district. We should not be willing to sit by and watch children with disabilities be handcuffed and traumatized. Additionally, this doesn't even consider the messaging we send to our students and to the community at large. My second grader would be deeply traumatized to watch one of his classmates with a disability be handcuffed, especially as a student who has a sibling with a disability. What message do we send to our children when we tell them the way to deal with an overwhelmed child is to physically overpower and restrain them? What protections are there for the nonverbal autistic child whose behavior is clearly communicating his distress? There are better ways to manage conflict, better training for all, all of our staff, our certified staff, our classified staff, and our administration. And that provides the tools that the adults need to de-escalate both children and adults who are having stress responses to their environment or their circumstances. Handcuffing children is not, with disabilities is not who we are at Fullerton School District. We are better than that. Thank you very much. Keiko Suda. Hi. Um, I am also a Fullerton School District parent, I'm a former middle school teacher. I spent uh, part of my career working with students transitioning out of juvenile hall and into mainstream schools, um, and I have a, first-hand experience with the criminalization of children that the previous speaker spoke so eloquently about. Um, I'd like to comment also on the third goal of the LCAP plan. Out of, I think there's four total goals, which is to provide a safe and secure environment. Um, one of the metrics listed under achieving this goal is suspension rates, which at, of course at middle school level is a way for us to know how effective we are at redirecting student behavior. If we're successful in engaging students and intervening early and consistently in problematic behavior, suspension rates should go down and stay down, right? What I find problematic and really antithetical to this desired outcome is the inclusion of a school resource officer on page 52 as a possible strategy for achieving this safe and secure environment goal. Um, all evidence around the effectiveness of SROs, which is the shorthand for school resource officers, quite, is really quite clear they don't make campuses safer or more secure. In fact, they lead to a steep increase in suspension rates, particularly for students of color and students with disabilities. Uh, so given all of this, uh, student school resource officers really can't be justified. I, I don't see how they're justified um, in a K through eight school district. As a parent of two incredible children, you know you can bet that I really want to employ the best, most world class evidence based strategies for keeping our children safe and secure at school. But SROs don't do that, and I really don't think that they have a place in our school district. Um, I ask humbly tonight that uh, school resource officers be removed from the LCAP action plan, that we don't waste any of our, you know, potentially declining budget resources on this non-solution. 
um, and that instead we focus our efforts on cutting edge real strategies that will actually keep our students safe and our campuses secure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Allison Dover. Hello, my name is Allison Dover. I'm the parent of a rising fifth grader at Beechwood Elementary and a rising eighth grader at Ladera Vista. I'm also a professor of education at Cal State University Fullerton with expertise in literacy, curriculum development, and culturally and linguistically sustaining education. I work with districts throughout the region to develop programs for newcomers and emergent bilingual students, several of which have won Golden Bell Awards and awards from the Orange County Department of Education. I'm here tonight to talk about the draft LCAP and the opportunities it presents to advance the board's stated commitment to high expectations, meaningful and culturally responsive instruction, and a positive school climate for all learners. When my family moved to Southern California from Chicago, we chose Fullerton because of the schools. We were drawn to the cultural and linguistic diversity of our student body, the breadth and rigor of the curricular and programmatic offerings, and the welcoming environments we experienced as we toured kindergarten and third grade classrooms. Since entering the district, we found much to appreciate about our children's teachers and experiences. I volunteered in many classrooms throughout the district, witnessed my own Cal State Fullerton students be hired on as teachers, and had the opportunities to attend conferences and professional development sessions led by FSD teachers and administrators. You don't need me to tell you that there are many things our district does well. However, there are also too many missed opportunities in our district, some of which are highlighted in this year's LCAP, which notes that despite overall very high scores for e English language arts within our district, our district's English learners, African American students, Hispanic students, lower SES students, and students experiencing homelessness score at what is described as a low level in both ELA and mathematics, while foster youth and students with disabilities scored at a very low level. This data is not an anomaly. Instead, it reveals a pervasive trend in our district and cannot be ignored. As we prepare our LCAP, it's imperative that we focus not only on listening tours and block parties, and certainly not on spending district resources on policing, but on research-based approaches that embrace and amplify the cultural and linguistic assets of all our children. For example, while I appreciate the district's emphasis on supporting English language development and the truly exciting expansion of our dual language programs, I wonder whether and how we leverage and affirm our emergent bilingual students by literacy in all of our district classrooms. For example, what kinds of multilingual resources do we have in our school and classroom libraries? How do we encourage students in general education classes to use all of their languages when communicating about academic concepts? How are monolingual English speakers taught to learn from their bilingual peers? Do our classrooms feature posters and academic resources that reflect the languages, racial identities, and cultural norms of our district's diverse students? Are our emergent bilingual students encouraged to use all of their languages when publishing their work in the classroom, presenting at open house, or developing parental education workshops? How do we support teachers who are monolingual in learning the languages spoken in our schools and districts? These are big questions and broader than anyone could answer here tonight. However, we're lucky to be in a district that's surrounded by resources, not only in terms of the rich resource of our students and communities themselves, but also fiscal resources and university partners who can support us in professional learning, program development, and the imp implementation of culturally and linguistically affirming policies at the classroom site and district level. I urge you to use this LCAP as an opportunity to develop personal and practical resources for supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion, and focus our budget on deepening and expanding our commitment to culturally and linguistically sustaining education. And finally, that ensuring that all district hires, especially those in leadership roles, bring the expertise and professional experience necessary to advance our efforts towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Jody Vallejo. Good evening, I'm Dr. Jody Aegis Vallejo. I'm a professor at USC, where I also serve as Associate Director of the USC Equity Research Institute. I am an expert on immigrant integration, racial ethnic demographic change, and social and economic mobility mechanisms like education. My daughter also attends the DLA program at Raymond School. And I read with great interest the LCAP 
and really appreciate all of the work that went into the report. I want to thank all of our parents and our community members and our staff and also you on the board and our administrators. But one of the things that really troubled me that's already been discussed tonight is this idea of correlating school safety with school resource officers, or SROs as they are known. SROs are sworn police officers who often carry firearms or other kinds of punitive solutions to thinking about safety. And SROs are being proposed as a solution to foster safe environments in our elementary schools. And I really urge the board and our administrators to think carefully about what safety means for us. What does safety mean for our community? And to prioritize evidence-based solutions to building school communities where all feel safe and welcomed. I want to relay three things about what the data and evidence tell us. First, recent studies which control for things like demographic characteristics show a link between schools with SROs and a higher number of arrests for students of color and higher rates of arrests for children under age 15, students in our elementary and junior high schools. Another really important thing that I think you need to be aware of is that SROs on campus do not thwart or prevent school shootings. And third, according to the Public Policy Institute of California, only 10% of elementary schools in California have SROs, compared to over a third of high schools. Police presence on elementary campuses are not the norm. So what is the goal that we want to accomplish? It seems that in our case, the concerns about safety stem from interactions between school staff and parents. As we all know, there have been a couple highly publicized um, things that have occurred on some of our school campuses. And I think it's imperative that we take seriously staff concerns about safety, but are SROs the answer? The data and evidence says otherwise. If we want schools to be engines of mobility and inclusion and safety, rather than punitive institutions, then the LCAP should allocate resources to promote students' mental health and well-being we should be going beyond school sites and take evidence and research-based approaches by fostering opportunities for discussion, care, and repair among not only students, but also parents within our communities. And one thing that you should also consider is that research and a large body of research that I'd be happy to provide to you shows that police presence at elementary schools deters particular groups of parents from wanting to come to campus out of fear. I know I'm out of time, but in this era where we are really uncertain about our budget, we have declining funds. I read that 500 page <laughs> budget report. I urge you to think carefully about what school safety means to our communities and don't add any new expenditures that lead us away from the data and the evidence and from our inclusive vision for our FSD schools. Thank you. Amina Mirza Kazi. Hi, good, uh, good evening. My name is Amina Mirzakazi. I'm the co-director of the Peace and Justice Law Center. Our mission, we focus at the intersection of community safety and public safety and explore decarceral solutions to keeping our community safe. I also happen to be a Fullerton resident and the proud mom of three children, one who is about to start in kindergarten, and two older kids. So I have, well, have two junior high kids and uh, kinder as well. My two of my older children are actually former foster youth. They, my kids are biracial. And as a mom, I've actually experienced within the Fullerton di School District with some administration, the quick jumps to conclusions. And I couldn't help but wonder if my daughter faced punitive responses because she was a black girl. This is a reality that many parents of children of color have to face. And the fact that in this LCAP, which I would echo, I completely appreciate all the work that has gone into it, is it is a tremendous document. But this one issue of having a school resource officer that could potentially further put our children at risk, as has been cited, um, to further punitive solutions is frankly terrifying to me as a mom. It's really terrifying. And as a professional who works in this arena, I do want to add that oftentimes when our communities feel unsafe, we do jump to the quickest show of force, show of strength. 
But those shows of strengths do not actually necessarily keep us safe. I'll give you an example. Many homes in Fullerton have gates and fences in front of the home. People like to feel safe. But there's this growing concept called crime prevention through environmental design that actually states if you have a hedge or a gate that's above two feet, you, that could actually be cover for perpetrators. And sometimes the things that keep people safe are open lines of sight additional lining, um, reinforced glass and doors in the front. Sometimes the things that people think on its face keep us safe actually make us less safe. And I feel that's the situation with the school resource officer, that our community really doesn't um, need it. And I think our community has been stated here, we choose nonviolence and we have the right in our community to choose nonviolence for our families and for our schools and for our children. Lastly, I want to add that there have been times when my kids, one, two, who I said are for, former foster youth, have shown up to school and I've requested to have them meet with the counselors and I've been told that the counselors are not on site that day. It is tremendously difficult when we are trying to seek those mental health solutions to see additional cuts to our mental health and counseling staff at our elementary and junior high schools. We should have dedicated personnel at every school every day. Just one more quick thing. Um, this also addresses um, the special mental health needs of, uh, for, of foster youth and homeless youth. And I would just implore you to consider offering those same services to former foster youth as well. Because youth, any child who has been in the foster care system and has now been adopted is facing a lifetime struggle of adapting and dealing with attachment disorder. So that is one thing I would like to amend. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes the public comments. May I ask a question? Can I just not stop the agenda? Yes, of course. Well, uh, I was going to ask if there are any other public comments to please see Anna and fill out a form. And if not, um, this is actually the perfect opportunity for the board to discuss the LCAP. And I, I just want to clarify a question. Sure, please. Your students, your students, your, your oh, I'm so sorry. Get on. Your students who were seeking help from counselors, that was not this year, correct? This year we have, a, we have dedicated counselors in all of our schools, I believe. Um, I, we can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Um, this year we, we have, I'm trying to remember correctly, we, we did have a counselor, but not the counselor that my daughter usually sees. Um, I can't remember if it was during COVID or prior to COVID where we were told that. Oh, I, ca I can't remember the exact date of when the counseling staff. So that would definitely be something I would want to make sure that there's counseling staff. We actually available. hired how many? 23? We have counselors at every school. At every school now right. because we felt your pain and we've realized the importance. So the entire board has gone down that and put the funds to make sure we have that. and. I'm glad it's something you see as a need because we're proud that we've stepped up and done that. If we're not experiencing that, who should we talk to about that? Because there is, I know, of at least one school site where um, mental health counselor is not available every day. Yes, please contact me. Okay. Yes, Dr. Chad Hammett. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Well, and the counselors have a caseload, so it, I mean, there are times where families seek support and they're told you got to wait two months or there are higher priority cases. I think it um, just because we have someone assigned at every single school doesn't mean we're meeting the demand. That's actually one of the questions I had for the LCAP was to see how are we measuring metrics of what our demand is versus how quickly we're able to meet it. And that ha also happens with doctors, sure. right? Sure. You want an appointment with your doctor, you feel you have a real urgent need, and sometimes they say, I'll see you in three weeks. It's not happy it's not a good feeling but sometimes that happens because it's not a perfect world unfortunately i agree with you that's that's a very upsetting thing to hear very upsetting this is a great Thank segue you. to the board having the opportunity um, tonight to discuss any other areas of emphasis concern um, based on what we've heard tonight so before we begin that formal discussion, I do also want to echo the, um, my sincere thanks to our entire LCAP committee 
that has put in countless hours, to our staff that have put together these um, block parties and other public arenas basically for us to gather information and to go out and get data from our community about how our district can improve. We are a great district. I believe this in my heart, but we can always be better. And, um, and also thank you to our parents that are here tonight that spoke out. Um, I'll just go ahead and start from this side. I will go ahead and start from this side, I meant to say, this side. Trustee Hanchett, did you want to begin with your thoughts on, so just to remind the public though, and um, a week from tonight, we will be voting on the contents mm -hmm. of the LCAP. And although we do not as a board participate in the actual drafting of the document, we do have like a Supreme Court, maybe a final review, <laughs> um, both opportunity and really responsibility. So I would like to open that discussion now during this public hearing. Trustee Hanchett? Okay. You know, I was, we had the presentation last month. I didn't know we were going to be discussing it, but I did send a lot of emails <laughs> to the LCAP team this week just to find out more, because I think there are some questions I have just as the newer person, and there are others that it, seeing all this document, all these details, it really does raise a lot of questions of how do we keep improving? You know, so it's not necessarily to question the report, but to ask for, dig deeper, right? So, I mean, just so the board knows what I was asking to find out more, I, I would put it into three different categories. One was, as I mentioned, I am curious about the indicators for how we're meeting our social, emotional, and mental health needs for our kids. Um, I think that there's, there were some indicators about the number of students that are identified as needing social, emotional support. Uh, we saw that rise this year. And I know we've, we've been told indicators of how, you know, the amount of trainings, the amount of curriculum that we're using, but I'd like, I'd love to see a little bit more measures of what that looks like. Um, I know I was looking at Santa Ana Unified now has a 250 to one ratio of counselors to students, you know, and so I don't know what our ratio is right now. I know we have different levels of mental health professionals and we have counselors and we have student support folks, you know, all kinds of levels of care, but I, I would like to dig in more to see how we're doing and, um, how we're allocating funding to meet those needs. That was one of my questions. Um, so, uh, the issue of uh, school resource officers was something that I also questioned. And um, I know we're gonna hear about that in our budget as well, but that was a concern of mine based on many of the evidence that was presented to us by the community today. Um, I was also looking at our progress of our English learners and thinking about how do we continue to pursue closing those gaps and, and providing more opportunity for multilingual learners, especially to thrive in, you know, thrive in, in Spanish or math class in Spanish, you know, whatever it takes to achieve their academic goals, even as they're learning English. Um, I'd like to see uh, us have more creative approaches to that work. And then, uh, you know, I know that we are working on this element of how do we care for our most vulnerable kids, the kids who are in foster care, experiencing homelessness, and those who have. And, you know, one of my concerns is one of the proposals was to look at uh, professional development for instructional quality. And I think that really, really our gap is around trauma-informed care and responding to many different barriers and needs that intersect for our kids. It's not just, we have excellent, I think, instruction and you know, everyone needs it, but especially digging down into the specific needs of those kids. That's, those were some questions I had. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, and, and part of it is maybe I just need to learn more about how we're gonna respond to those challenges. Thank you, Trustee Hanchett. Um, Trustee Sugarman, did you have any thoughts, comments, questions on the LCAP thus far? Well, of course, I wanna thank everyone who worked on it. Amazing job, hard work. And while that we only have one layer of questioning, that's like amazing, right? That the rest is approved. I'm just so proud of our committee, and I'm proud that parents have taken the time to read those 500 pages and to get back to us with such uh, astute findings, mm -hmm. and I wanna thank you. I do wanna say, I don't know if the concept of SRO came because I said 
on, I volunteer on the SARB board, and we do have a policeman, a, a God policeman, uh, what Sergeant? Sergeant, Sergeant Bridges. Sergeant Bridges, oh my God, brain freeze. He's wonderful. He gives us information at our meetings that um, make our decisions effective, more effective, and more appropriate for students and their families. For those that don't know, SARP is where students have many, many days of absence beyond what you would believe. And we want to help the whole family. This is not a punitive board. This is a board to help. And having a policeman on that board is an effective, wonderful thing. And I believe, am I correct that the police are cutting back on um, assistance to schools in the, in the future because of the city's budget? Is that correct? Well, I know there's been a, a severe reduction in the amount of staff the Pollution Police Department has um, in terms of homicide and things like that. But I think that the police in terms of how that would impact schools, that would probably be a better conversation for the high school district because they actually staff the, the SROs, whereas we don't have um, SRO staff within the Fullerton School District. But, but this is a different person, right? What, I think, uh, trustee, not SRO. Sugarman, no, 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 no. What I'm saying is we do get some police support and they give us help, okay? I'm not saying that we have to have an SRO at every school. What I'm saying is, um, the picture is broader. I guess that's what I need to say. It's a broader picture. It has many fingers. And um, I am going to assume that the people who worked on the uh, LCAP thought about that. But I really like what you brought to us. I like that you brought us research and definitive information. And I am sure that our, our super, assistant superintendent is going to take back to our superintendent and our entire executive cabinet your concerns because it's important to hear them. And I appreciate that. But I also want you to know that we do have a relationship with the police, okay? In terms of teaching children with special needs, I'm sort of proud that our district has co-teaching where students with special needs are placed in the same classroom as children who have regular needs, you might say. And it goes on in several of our schools. We're a pilot program at Cal State from Cal State Fullerton originally, and it's been super successful. Staff likes it, parents like it, and we think that students are on both sides of the classroom, you might say, are profiting from these experiences. So yes, I believe that we are a very creative school district and that we're not gonna stop being creative. But personally, I don't have those solutions and I'm gonna put it on my staff to come back with more creative solutions. The Uh-oh, this could be a problem. Don't give me a microphone. All I need is a soapbox. But they talked about increasing the TK and kindergarten um, co-teach programs. They've actually decreased it. For next year, there is a reduction in the TK and kindergarten co-teach programs. Um, my child is actually in the co-teach program at Hermosa. They have eliminated the TK, kinder, and first grade um, co-teach at Hermosa, as well as the upper elementary. And there is now only one co-teach at Hermosa. Third, fourth? Um, so, third, fourth. It's a uh, second, third. Second, third. And um, in the middle and there. It's it's trending in that direction in all of the schools. Um, I'm a huge as an educational advocate. Co-teach is my jam. I love I like it for it also, all my kids. You can tell. I want more of it. I'm like, if you can, I'm gonna, I'm begging you, more of it. But it's expensive. There's a there's a personnel cost involved with it. So it's great to see that in the LCAP that that's a goal, but unless we're willing to commit the finances to support it, um, it's real hard to look at that, to read that, 
and literally have come from Hermosa where they're like, yeah, I'm not doing it next year. Well, perhaps we'll have a report on that in the months to come, okay? And because, like you. I would like to clarify, the co-teach program, we don't have less programs. The programs were just moved from Hermosa, drive to some other schools in the district. Right now, Pack and Commonwealth is the only two that I know of. Pack, Commonwealth, and Richmond. Richmond. Yes. Richmond's always had. So. so we went from four to six. Same number of classes. Thank you for clarifying. That makes me happy to know it's continuing because I personally agree with you. I, I enjoy being in that program. And, um, you know, as we look at our budget in the next few minutes, we're going to have to look at all the considerations because 13,000 kids, less, little under 13,000, have to be represented and thought of in every way also. But there's no question we want to look at all the students, children who are in general ed, children who are in gifted. We need to service all of their needs. Children who are artistic, children who uh, have math talents, those are all important. And I like that our LCAP looked at a broad range of student performance. That's really important. So I thank you and I thank the team and your ideas and your comments will certainly be brought back from Chad to speak to us some more. Thank you for that clarification, Chad. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from LCAP? Um, Trustee Berryman? My notes are not as uh, succinct as, as others. Um, I, as I'm looking through this and getting my questions answered as well, um, I, I do, uh, again, thank everybody that's come to speak tonight. I, uh, I don't think we've ever had this many public comments at our public meetings for our LCAP. So it's appreciated that people are reading it and that they're commenting because as board members, this is what we need to hear. So I appreciate the fact that you guys are coming and speaking on behalf of this, um, because it takes all of us to work together to make this to make this work. And so um, I really truly appreciate it. I'm sure the rest of my board members do as well. Um, bringing up great great thoughts about our SRO, and I think what, as we look at this and we look at programs could include, maybe limit you know may include. I kind of like that word may include because again we're taking a look at this and. SROs are a bit are big. That subject we haven't talked about very much as a group, um, and so that is something that we really do need to take a look at because the LCAP committee could talk about safety, and you know the first thing, like you said, is to jump towards you know bringing authoritative people on on site, and we know that's not the best for our kids. So um, bringing that up for me, that's a concern. So I, I thank you for for making that um, bringing that up as well. Um, allocating, um, looking at our ratios to counselors, I think is a really good thing to look at. And I, um, I really want to, you know, I would love to reduce every class size we have, right? But obviously we aren't doing that. But looking at staff ratios and looking at counselor ratios um, at our schools and, and knowing that not just some schools need it, every school needs it. And I think we forget that all schools and all students have been hit hard with COVID, not just some schools, so all of our kids and all of our families need that extra support. Um, uh, I've got uh, on here creative approaches. You know, it's looking outside the box, looking at what we're gonna do. Um, fortunately, this is what, the third year of our LCAP and uh, we start over again next year on really starting to, to take a look at things. I know that we are, uh, another thing that really concerns me is the chronic absenteeism of our vulnerable students. Um, how are we going to address that? And I know we've, we've spoke on that in the LCAP. Um, I know that there are programs through the Orange County Department of Ed that address some things that could help us with looking at our vulnerable youth and really understanding where they're coming from and what's going on in their lives and being able to address mental health and provide them with wrap services, provide them with things that they need in order to, become, to, to get to school um, and to be able to learn. Because obviously if kids are coming to school after a traumatic event, they're not ready to learn. They're, they're not in that space. And so anything that we can do 
and our staff to train our staff on how to how to embrace those kids and how to look at what they're what they're going through is important. Um, professional development on trauma informed care. I you know you're speaking my language obviously. Um, it is in our LCAP, um, but I I definitely want to see and I and and I haven't seen the I haven't fine tuned my budget review yet. Um, the way that we just got it. Um, but I want to see where our professional development dollars are, you know, because I do think that that is a gap. That is something that, as a district, training our, providing training to our teachers, providing training to those that are there at the, you know, when those children first walk on site, you know, what, how are they trained? How, you know, what do they look for? How do they deal with it? Um, is it, you know, are you just going to send someone out of the room? How do you mitigate that? And. And I think our teachers don't know how to do that, and it's not their fault. It, it, no, you know, not everyone knows how to deal with, with trauma and with how to embrace our kids when they come in. So, uh, those are definitely things that are very important to me and very important in in looking at our LCAP and looking at where we're going to put our resources coming up. Um, uh, what else do I have on my list of things? DEI and multi, you know, I. Uh, as I look through this, and we're, we just finished our sixth grade, right, at, at our first um, dual immersion program, um, one thing that I'm interested in doing is, is taking a look at what that, what that data told us, mm -hmm. right? It's, we needed a graduating class. We, we now have some data. We have data from other, you know, other classes that don't have the data. And I really want to look at that and, and see if, in fact, that was something that helped our students progress because that was the whole that's part of the purpose of it, not only to experience the culture and to uh, and that, but it was to help our English language learners be able to to succeed. And I would, and so I think we were talking to Phil about that. Is this, I would really like to see that data, and I don't know where that comes, but that's something that stems from this is is being able to do that because, in fact, if if we're showing that it's successful, can we take some of those little things that we're doing in those classrooms? Mm -hmm. It may not be the whole program. It may not be, you know, pushing it all in. But can we take something that we're doing that's really successful to those students to be able to help push their push them along in their learning? So um, I'd be interested to see that. Yeah. Um, what else do I have on my list? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've got. I had. I had all my pages earmarked, you guys, and then I, I just. Then I was as I was going through them, I stopped earmarking them. Um, but I think that, you know, again, RTI has been something that we've put a lot of time and effort into. Um, I think that, you know, the data shows that we've been doing great, you know, and so that's my, that's my compromise for lower class sizes is, R is RTI coaches everywhere mm -hmm. um, to be able to help our students. But again, you know, there's so, you know, th there's so much that we have to do for our students um, and taking every step we can forward. Um, root causes of why chronic absenteeism is there and, and our relationship with the Department of Ed to be able to try and find that data. Why are our kids missing? Um, and what can we do to help that? I know is in here as well, so that was yeah, that, right. that was good for me. Um, I think that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Perryman. Um, Trustee Talavera? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try not to repeat so much that was said already, but um, I'm, I'm pretty much nodding my head at a lot of the comments that uh, my fellow trustees are are mentioning i also do want to um you know applaud and acknowledge all the hard work that went into um developing the the lcap um, and i'm also glad to see our parents and our community being engaged and involved in, in this process as well with us i mean this is super helpful and beneficial information for us uh, or for me specifically but uh, again also for for my fellow trustees um yeah so I, all the hard work that went into this um I, there's a few things that I do want to chime into um, with professional development as well too. So I think that's pretty keen. Um, as a school district, we're we're evolving, and and the society around us is also evolving. So um, knowing that we gotta also kind of change with with time um, and not stay stagnant, um, especially after the pandemic. So I think um, to something that you mentioned, uh, Trustee Berryman, um, I think that's that's huge. Every year is gonna be a different shift, a different look. Um, especially for that age group that, right, that went through and missed, you know, pretty much a whole year of, of in-person learning. So looking at what that looks like, um, 
and just being ready. Um, I think as a district, I think we do pretty good as far as not just you know jumping into conclusions right away, uh, but really taking our time and making sure that you know that we vet what that's going to look like, um, and still try to get out ahead of it. Um, and and that's all the trust that we put into to our staff and administration um, in that. So really looking at where those dollars are going uh, for professional development is something that I kind of you know did asterisk. Um, in my notes on there as well too, but and then also the multilingual, like what, what would that look like? And I like the way you would kind of express it. Could it be like a semi-dual language, you know, class or course, knowing that we have a lot of, you know, multilingual kids, you know, in a classroom that's, you know, the general ed class, uh, a gen class, um, what, what does that look like? Um, and making sure that, you know, we're supporting them in, in that sense. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, that that first class, I think Trustee Decor and <laughs> Trustee Hanchett, you had your kids were the guinea pigs in a sense. <laughs> it was in, fabulous. In, 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 in going through that, but yeah, looking at what that data looked like, and it'll be you know mm -hmm. interesting to see because I know my kid's going through it right now, third grade, mm -hmm. going into fourth grade. So you know he's almost there, mm -hmm. um, but kind of looking at what that looks like. So for student achievement, definitely, um, those are kind of my key key areas of of looking. Um, at that as well too, but and then also for like special education support, uh, looking ways to making sure that both principals and, and assistant principals have the support that they also need in order to kind of trickle down some of that that workload and and how they get you know and how they support both not just students but teachers as well too um, at their school sites. So that's for me. I did forget my my in depth notes, um, but I, I have the gist of it here. Um, definitely looking at uh, safe facilities as well too, which is kind of really near and dear to my heart. Um, thank you for reaching out as far as SROs um, in that component. Um, I have a few questions that I'll be asking um, as well too, kind of what that looks like at our school sites, because I know we do get communique on, on how uh, the Fulton Police Department is involved at our school sites. Um, if there's ever an, an incident um, that occurs. So we, we get reports on that. I gotta go like freshen up and see what that looks like, you know, for the last year or so um, on there. Um, definitely continuing to support social emotional learning. I mean, that's, again, pretty keen, knowing after coming out of the pandemic, um, making sure that each school site knows what their community is, is really in need. Um, I don't think there's a, there's a, a, a cookie cutter all right, support what that looks like for all our school sites, but in general, uh, making sure that, that we have a, an ear to the ground to what, what, that's gonna, um, what that's gonna entail for each school site. Um, and I think also, again, speaking to um, a lot of the um, interventions um, and systems and support, making sure, that, again, uh, school site administration has the support that they need in order to really truly enact uh, those supports uh, for for our students and our teachers. Um, again, um, I'll probably chime in again, saying um, you know, what that looks like for, for our principals and counselors and, and SSAs as well too, um, our student support uh, administrators uh, there um, and assistants there. Um, yeah, that's pretty much in a nutshell without having to kind of just double up on what uh, folks have mentioned as well. Rainy, can I just yeah. add one little comment? Yeah. I just want to clarify too, I know in July we're supposed to have a conversation about safety, and so I think some of these conversations about our relationship with the police, our reliance on them in emergency situations, we can discuss in July when we hear the report on um, kind of response to emergency situations. But just to be clear, like the idea of a proposed, the possibility of an SRO school resource officer, it would be paid out of our budget to be someone who is assigned to work for FSD, right? Versus what we currently have is police doing their job, assisting you know our most vulnerable citizens when we need them in emergency situations, or building positive relationships, which is good for both of us, you know, FSD and the city and our police department. I think that that distinction is important. That we're not saying we would, you know, no longer want a positive relationship with Fullerton Police Department, but simply asking the question: Is a FSD funded? dedicated officer necessary to keep us safer. 
I you? appreciate that clarification. I just wanted to say to, to clarify an exchange from earlier this evening. I think maybe all of us have had positive experiences with mm -hmm. um, our police department, in particular Sergeant Bridges. Absolutely. Um, Sergeant Bridges' role, my understanding, is changing. He will not be our main contact at the Fullerton School District. And so this SRO is uh, intended to be a different officer. And I think that was a question. I, that is my understanding as well. But also engaging the community in different capacities, it sounds like. Yes, yeah, hence the new position and okay. new funding um, arrangement that would be proposed. Trustee Talavera, were you going to yeah. So to? also besides the SRO, I mean, I think we, with that strong relationship that, that both the Fulton School Districts has with um, the Fullerton Police Department, they also provide other resources, right, as mm -hmm. well, too, that are maybe mm -hmm. not paid out of our, our budget. Um, do we know if, if the new uh, community liaison officer that they just hired on not too long ago would be, like, I, do, do, have, do we know? We, we haven't had a chance, really, to work with Fullerton mm -hmm. Police on that. They just made the announcement, so we do need some time to interact with them and determine what that would look like going into the new year. We can say mm -hmm. that we have had a very good relationship, and they've been very supportive for school events, mm -hmm. um, incidents we've had at schools, helping and assisting with areas where we need help with traffic or um, any, any number of events that, that may have happened or events that happen outside of our schools yet impact our schools. Mm -hmm. They've been very responsive. So, um, however, with a new structure, I, I will say we don't know what that looks like at this point. Thank you. Well, just to continue on that point, I, did you have any further? I just had a, I have a question and I think that I'm sure that we'll address it. I, I, as we talk about this with Sergeant Bridges, is there, did I miss something? I, maybe I, I don't, I don't, I did not hear that. So I was just kind of wondering if somebody can clarify yeah, I don't want to start any rumors either. Dr. Hammett, <laughs> can you clarify? I mean, if we wanted, if we just really asked very nicely, Sergeant Bridges, can we just keep the, everything the way that we somewhere? have? No, I don't think that's it. Again, no, but he's not going to be our campus guy or our FSD person. Are, are they replacing him? I, I, I'm not at liberty to say at this okay. point. <laughs> okay. I understand there'll be some changes, so. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I don't want my comments to be interpreted as anything derogatory towards Fullerton Police Department. Mm -hmm. The statistics that I cited, as well as everybody else, they're documented. It's what happens when you put an SRO on a campus. Sometimes. So I think there's a, it's, it's a very specific, very different thing. And I just would hate to see our very badly needed education dollars go towards a police department person when the police department should be doing that. Thank you. So Dr. Hammond. Can I, can, oh, go ahead. Oh, can, Trustee Sugarman, please. I, I, want, I did want to point out in our summary, our annual update table of what we plan to spend and what we did spend, that the highest increase, we, we doubled the amount of money for, um, increase numbers of staff at highest need sites. And so I, when we talk of priorities and how we're implementing these goals, I want you to know that we went from an, al an anticipated allocation of $468,344, is that, is that how I read the number, to nine hundred and forty four thousand eight hundred and one dollars almost a million and showing our priority for helping sites that had the greater need and that's the highest um, overspending or, or increase in allocations that we did last year and so I don't want you to leave thinking that we're not 
concerned about these people, these young, wonderful people. Uh, I, I don't have a page number. I certainly would give it to you. It's two pages before the end, okay? Right here. It's on our, um, our summary of LCAP, okay? Any other questions or comments at this time from the board? Because I wanted to clarify a few things, if there aren't any. So Dr. Hammett, now that the board has identified areas of emphasis, areas of deeper dives into data as it relates to LCAP, and specifically possible as questions about a spending priority, which is going to be discussed outside of LCAP as well at the next meeting, what would the next steps be? Um, does LCAP need to be approved at the next meeting? LCAP does need to be approved at the next meeting. Uh, however, based upon feedback from the board, feedback from the community, we'll go back and we will look at the LCAP and look at make some adjustments and get information out to the board regarding the comments that were made tonight um, in particular areas that were noted. Okay. Thank you. And uh, realizing that this is a pretty large document and the meeting is in one week, is there a timeline that you might be willing to offer for the board to expect? some type of response? Yes, we will actually probably begin working tonight, um, <laughs> as a matter of fact. And I hope to be able to get uh, items back to the board uh, no later than Thursday morning. Okay. So hypothetically, totally hypothetically, mm. is it possible to leave um, something in the LCAP, which is represents maybe the will of the process, but not fund it under a separate vote? And it, it is possible. There are times that you cannot fund everything in the LCAP, or maybe you make a little different change of priorities in items that might, that might be in the LCAP as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to close this topic's public hearing. The longest public hearing we've ever had. At yes. 719. <laughs> yes. And then. Wait, are we having a public hearing on the budget? I'm going to reopen for public hearing or keep the public hearing open? Very good. Well, oh then, um, right. it is my privilege and honor to close tonight's um, public hearing regarding um, the 2023-2024 Local Control Accountability Plan at 7.19 p.m. I'd also like to adjourn for five minutes for a restroom break. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to come back.
Right, welcome back, uh, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, I now declare a public hearing at, se at 7.27 p.m. to allow for public comment regarding the proposed 2023-2024 budget. We are going, we do have one public comment um, and after which time we will then have the presentation. And because I did read board bylaw 9323 into the record previously, I will not read it again. Would Karen Yingling please come to the podium for her public comment? I would remind you that it will be three minutes and timed. Thanks. Um, I just wanna touch on the budget quickly. I did not full disclosure, read the bazillion page document. Um, but I would ask the board as um, an advocate, and I work in districts all over the county, um, the classified staff shortages that we've experienced this year are not unique to our district. But one of the things that I have noticed is that in districts where our instructional aides are, pay, are hired full time and paid full-time and given full-time benefits, um, they have a significantly lower turnover rate. Um, and I'm thinking right now of Brea, for example. Most of their IAs are full-time and they get full-time rates. Most of their bus drivers are full-time and they get full-time rates. And that makes a huge difference in the quality of the education that's delivered to our students, but it also makes a huge difference for the teachers. Um, when teachers have dependable instructional aids, when they know um, that the same person who's been there last year and the year before is gonna be there next year, um, when they know on the first day of school that those instructional aides are gonna be out there um, and be the same ones, it makes their lives significantly less stressful and less stressed teachers are better teachers. Um, it's the same and full, really, really full disclosure, my husband is a bus driver for the district um, and he, he loves the district. He's not going anywhere, Mike. Don't worry. But he gets run at all the time because um, some of the other districts pay their bus drivers 40 hours and full benefits. Um, and that matters um, to some families um, and some drivers. So I think when we look at, at the professional development in some of the LCAP issues of how do we retain good teachers, so much of it is those people that support those teachers, the recess staff people, the lunch people, the I guess it's nutrition people now, I'm old. Those were the lunch ladies when I was in school. Um, it matters um, to them the quality of people that we have. So as you all look at the budget and make the hard decisions, there is longer term impact to how we, how we pay um, and how we retain our classified staff and the roll up effect that has on it. Thank you very much. I don't see any other public comments um, for this public hearing. So thank you everyone. Um, as in the last topic, this would be an opportunity for the board to um, state their uh, preferences, their emphasis, uh, questions and comments about our proposed budget. Is he, gonna do a presentation first? he is going to do a presentation and then we can have our comments afterward. Dr. Coglin? Thank you. <laughs> Trustee Berryman. No I was just going to say ditto everything that was great from the last discussion. <laughs> but. We work in here? Yes, there we are. All right, uh, President DeCour, trustees, executive cabinet, guests, thank you for being here tonight. We are here to pre uh, present the proposed 23-24 school budget. And uh, trustees, you each have a notebook with the presentation and the, the backup uh, documents in it. That is for you. Um, and so we'll just get right into this here. We'll talk a little bit about what is in this presentation. Uh, we're gonna talk about what your responsibility is as a Board of Education. We're 
going to look at where do we estimate we're going to end this year with the unrestricted um, actuals. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, a budget, the general fund is made up of unrestricted funds and restricted funds. About 80% of the budget is uh, unrestricted. Restricted funds are your you know, federal, a lot of federal funds. And so um, what we receive, we spend, it's in the unrestricted area where you can have some carryover. So we're gonna mainly be focusing on unrestricted tonight. We're gonna look at the governor's May revision uh, that he came out with um, last month. Talk a little bit about the fiscal economic outlook uh, from different perspectives. And then we will look at the budget for next year. 20, and using what assumptions we use, not, not what guesses we use, but based on the current data that we have, what assumptions we're gonna use to put this budget together. And something that's unique with school districts uh, compared to the state of California, the state of California is have to come up with a budget for one year. Uh, we have to come up with a budget that is for the current year plus two years. And we have to show that we can meet our financial obligations. And so we'll take a look at what that looks like. Uh, there are other funds that I want to highlight uh, for this year and next year, and then we'll talk about next steps. So with that, board responsibility. Um, as trustees, you're responsible for reviewing the financial status of the district. We do it periodically throughout the year. You approve the spending plan, which is what you're going to do next week at, on June 20th um, for 23-24, and also review the subsequent two years of pattern of revenues and expenditures. And then we need to adopt the budget by June 30th. All goes well, we will adopt our budget on June 20th. So what I'd like to do is do a little comparison of, I was up here in March and we talked about the second interim and where I said we, I thought we were gonna end up and then where we ended up. So we'll take a look at that and we'll look at, again, unrestricted revenue. So I don't put all the numbers out. I don't list nine digits when we're talking about $136 million. I try to round up a little easier possibly to understand and it's when it's late at night it's a lot easier looking at three or four numbers than nine or eleven numbers so from second interim to estimated actuals where we think we're going to end up revenue is slightly higher about hundred and sixty thousand dollars that's due to some extra uh, TK students that we received and funding for those students you'll notice that federal revenue is zero because federal revenue is restricted um, state revenue is down a little bit um, when they finally adjusted for the uh, lottery apportionment that was down about forty thousand dollars and um, good news is uh, interest rates uh, on our savings was a little bit higher than we projected so we picked up about two hundred and twenty thousand dollars extra in interest so all in all from second interim revenue improved about three hundred and forty thousand dollars and when we look then at expenditures, what happened? Our expenditures improved overall about $120,000. We spent $120,000 less. Um, we had some increased cost in uh, certificated substitutes and classified substitutes, some extra time. That's what our certificated salaries are, actually the certificated substitutes. Um, classified salaries right, were right where they were supposed to be. Um, our books and supplies, it's not just books, but it is supplies. So we had some overage with our, um, our maintenance and repairs that wasn't covered by routine restricted maintenance that then hit the general fund. Uh, as you know, we have buildings that are very old, 60, 70 years old, and they require repair. And we try to estimate what those repairs are gonna be, but you never know. When things give out, they give out. and we had things that gave out between March and May. Um, services and operating expenses decreased. We did that by transferring some of those expenditures to some uh, restricted funds and contributions, again, to rut routine restricted maintenance went up about $120,000. So, but overall, the net effect is down $120,000. So when you look at it, at second interim, we were projecting a deficit of about 4.27 
million dollars for the year. We started with 26.49 million, and we ended. We're projecting we it's second interim. We thought we were going to end at 22.22. We're going to end up slightly higher. So the deficit for the year is $3.81 million. It's important to know that of that $3.81 million in deficit, there was carryover from last year, uh, $2.43 million that wasn't spent last year, that is now spent this year, which adds to that $3.81 million. Don't get too excited about it. We'll talk about carryover from this year to next year. So all in all, second interim to now, um, situation improved a little bit. So that's, we like that. We like good news. Um, in January, the governor comes out with his budget, or her budget. In this case, it's his budget. And in May, they do a May revision. They look and they say, well, what is, what's changed since January? And there have been a few things that have changed. but. Um, where I get my information from is we subscribe to uh, School Services of California. Uh, we get information from them. We get information from Kevin Gordon with Capital Advisors. We get information from the County Office of Education. So what you're going to see on these next few slides is not, it's not my predictions or assumptions. It's what I receive from them. So. Basically, a few surprises. Revenues are down compared to January. That wasn't, we knew that going into May. Um, in the May revise, the governor's not proposing to dip into the rainy day fund, which is something we didn't have in the last recession. Um, it's, he's not proposing to do that right now. Might he have to do that in the future? Perhaps. So there's also gonna be some uncertainty regarding our tax receipts in October. Um, filing of taxes was pushed out into October, and typically what happens when it's April 15th, we kind of have a good idea of what the funding is that's going to carry us into next year. This time, we're not going to know until October, and when the numbers are counted, it's probably not going to be till Thanksgiving, and is any governor going to want to release that information necessarily or what they're going to do if the numbers come in lower? Probably not. So do we anticipate cuts in October, November, if it comes in lower? No, but it will impact possibly uh, how we're funded. Do we receive, are, are we gonna have deferrals? Uh, are there gonna be reductions in the future, next year's budget? Is he then going to dip into the rainy day fund? We don't know. Um, for K-12 education, there's a COLA that's up uh, from 8.13%. It's at 8.22%. Um, let's hope that can stay. Uh, what funds the COLA is the revenue uh, that comes in. He proposed significant cuts to both of the one-time block grants, the, um, the arts, music, instructional materials, discretionary block grant. He's um, which is money that was received this year, he's talking about reducing that, cutting it in half, which is a pretty sizable amount for our district. We would lose about $3.7 million. And then from the learning recovery, a decrease of about 32% of what was given this year, which for Fullerton would be a loss of about $4.8 million. So as we've put this budget together, we have used the assumptions that it is going to be reduced so we have not included that revenue in, in this budget. Could that change? That could change. We did that with the advice of um, Orange County Office of Department of Education, who ultimately uh, approves the budget after the board does. Um, and so the governor is also proposing to stay the course with TK and ELOP and Universal Meals, which is great, so not proposing any reductions in that. Um, one of the things that we know and that we're hearing about is this general fund revenue growth that we saw post-COVID, that's, that's kind of over right now, that unprecedented growth. Uh, there is a budget shortfall that in January was thought to be 22.5 million. It's now projected at 31.5 million. And the Department of Finance, which is a cabinet level um, department, 
is projecting slow revenue growth and they assume no recession. If you talk to the legislative analyst office, which is a nonpartisan, uh, they say, well, there's about probably a 50-50 chance of a recession in 23-24, a mild recession. So we're getting mixed information there. The governor did uh, take note of some possible risks to revenues, and one of those being, you know, if interest rates remain high, that has an impact on the stock market. And when the st uh, interest rates go up, typically st uh, stock market goes down, profits go down, um, people aren't making money in the stock market and they're not paying tax on that money that they make from there. Um, financial institution instability in March and between March and May 1st, we had four uh, banks that went under for almost a half a trillion dollars. So I think that's calmed down a little bit. And of course, these delayed tax receipts. We're not going to know what happens until October. And it's important to note that on income taxes, 50% of the revenue that is received in income taxes is paid by the highest 1% earners in California. Where does their money usually come from? It comes from the stock market. And so the stock market's been pretty flat. And uh, so we can only um, speculate that perhaps uh, tax revenue won't come in that high. Some other indicators, uh, unemployment still is low, so that's a good thing. The housing market has also been in a slump, uh, whether that's due to uh, higher interest rates, um, it's just you know, supply chain, there's not a lot of new houses and sales that are happening. And as I said, kind of a 50-50 chance of a recession. So as far as Prop 9, the governor is proposing uh, the minimum guarantee. The way Prop 98 works is K-12, actually K-14, education receives about 40% of the revenue that comes in. So he's saying schools, you're going to get $106.8 billion. That's the minimum guarantee. And I'm not going to tap into the uh, reserve cap. The COLA, he's saying that he's going to fund the COLA at 8.22% uh, COLA. LAO came out and said, Remember that nonpartisan one that said, well, maybe you should think about like 5.11% and deficit the other part, but they're not going to do that. So we're receiving all 8.22% of that COLA. And um, there actually is an increase. It's the way there, there's an increase to the Prop 98 general fund uh, based on uh, to LCFF. It has to do with enrollment. It has to do with attendance. It has to do with... Again, California's in declining enrollment, so they are putting more money in, but it's still a little uh, tenuous. Let's see here. Some other things uh, with the pension. PERS, there's kind of no relief in sight for PERS. Uh, the California, or the uh, PERS, the uh, Public Employee Re uh, Retirement System, Right now, uh, this year, we were at 25.37%. Next year, it goes up to 26.68%. And then three years after that, it caps out at 28.7%. Good news is on STRS, it's, it's kind of, they capped it at 19.10%, but still remains, uh, remains pretty high. As I said, good news, universal meals, still there. That's great. They're going to fund all of those meals. That's wonderful. Some of the reductions that I do want to highlight again, the Prop 28 money, we still don't really know. We're on hold. That's the one, the arts, that was voted on. We don't really know what that decrease could look like for us because we haven't even received the money for this year. And then for the arts and music, a loss of about $3.7 million for the district and learning recovery of about $4.8 million. So with all of that good news, uh, which is not really good news, we kind of then use this information to make our assumptions based on uh, for next year. And so... Rob, I have a question about Prop, Prop, 9, Prop, Prop 28. Prop 28. Because it's a proposition, I thought he couldn't, we can't, they can't touch that money. I thought because the proposition passed that even though there's no, you know, they don't have any guidelines or anything yet, that, that, that at least the funding would not be touched. 
Yes. Um, I'll get more information on the Prop 28. Uh, we asked that same kind of question yeah. of Kevin Gordon, and it's still just kind of stuck up there in right. the Capitol. Right. And so, but right, Prop 28 was passed by the voters. Right. And so, as, if, as I get more information on that, I'll, I'll pass that along. I believe, yeah. if I'm not wrong, that last time we were having financial troubles in the early 2000s, that they took and they gave that money they credited toward the 49% we get of state income. And so it was just making it from um, unrestricted funds to restricted funds. Does that make sense? Remember that? But I thought they wrote in it that you know, I have no idea, but I know that's what they did last time. Well, and I can tell you in 2012 when they passed, Prop I don't know, that may be what you're talking about, when they passed Proposition 30, it was supposed to be money for education, and what it did was it really just backfilled what they were going to cut us. So it wasn't new money. They used it to kind of make us whole. So it's possible we could see something like that again. That's why I thought they wrote it in that you can't do Possibly. So we'll, we'll, we will look. They don't have any idea how we're going to do it anyway. Right. Well, so we haven't, we haven't budgeted for those funds uh, coming in. So when we look at next year, we, can, we see where we think we're gonna end this year and then we run the numbers and see where do we estimate based on enrollment and attendance and, and all those things of where we're gonna be at. And so the good news is revenue is gonna be a little higher next year, about $7.25 million. Again, it's a 8.22% COLA, um, but it's really only about 5.67% of an increase, and I'll show you here in a minute how that happens. Um, other local revenue is going to go down about $670,000. That interest we received this year, well, because we have less money earning interest, that will go down that amount of money. So how is it, why is an 8.22% COLA only a 5.67% COLA? If you look at LCFF, it's, it's, there's four main parts to it. The base, the grade span adjustment, supplemental, and concentration. The base funding, which is the largest part of it, uh, is actually going up $4.4 million. Going back to a little junior high math, uh, that's a 3.99% increase. You take the change over the original price, that gets you 3.99%. Why is it that it's not 8.22. It has to do with enrollment loss that we had during COVID, and it has to do with what we're funded on. Um, we're funded on ADA. ADA is not an enrollment. ADA is when kids come to school and they're in their seats. And in 2020 and 21 and 21, 22, we were what's known as held harmless during COVID. We, we lost about 1,200 students during those two years but our funding was not reduced during those two years. If it had been reduced in those two years, it would have been a loss of about $12 million. Wow. And so for this year's budget, they came up with a soft landing, if you will. And so this year when we received over a 13% COLA, we really didn't get a 13% COLA. It was more like about a eight point some half percent COLA because they took 4 million, they, Four million of the 12 million that we owed, they cut us this year, four million. And they're gonna do it again next year, and they're gonna do it again the following year until we get back down to where we're receiving the money based on ADA and enrollment. And so I put a chart on the bottom here. You'll see that for 22-23, um, our enrollment was 11,682, but our funded ADA is actually higher which is impossible to do. Kids can't come to school more than 100% of the time. I know staff uh, are here more than 100% of the time. And <laughs> sometimes some kids are, but we don't, they don't pay us for those kids. Next year, well, you you'll are. see Dr. Hammett is here 108% of the time. <laughs> and that's just today. Yeah. The other times it's more. Uh, for 23, 24, you'll see it's getting a little closer to the enrollment. Uh, typically, funded ADA runs about 97, 96, 97%. So you'll see back in 24, 25, we finally get to where we're at. So that's why, and it's really important when people say, hey, you received an 8.22% COLA this year. You should, you know, spend like you have 8.2. Well, we really did. 
we received 5.67. What has helped us out is uh, the great span. Uh, we're getting a little bit more money. We receive um, money for uh, the lower GK. grades, mm -hmm. and which were kind of low there. And our supplemental and concentration funds have gone up. That means our students that are identified as low income has gone up. And we've been able to identify those students and claim those students. And so where we used, where, where our number um, of unduplicated students used to be around six, uh, used to be about 54%, we are now at 65%, excuse me, 60%. The increase in concentration money is 65% of an increase. So that's good news, is that there's more money coming in there. Any questions about this chart? I know it's not the easiest chart, and it's kind of a strange concept to, when we're talking about enrollment and ADA. Hey. My only question was at the very end of like the 24, 25, 25, 26, you have funded ADA is less than the enrollment? Thank you. That's what I was gonna ask. Correct. Is that because okay. it's based on because, the previous number? So enrollment, uh, if you think about it, if you have an enrollment of 10,000 students, but your ADA, but your attendance rate is 97%. Because oh, okay. they're not going to all at school at the same time. Right. Got it. But we try to get close to 100 by we're, doing our Saturday schools. We work hard. Okay. As a Got plug it. for next year, come to Saturday school. Okay. All so right. So we can make that, up those days. It's back to that question of do we change the system so we fund based on enrollment or attendance? And that would be great if we could change that system. <laughs> but right now, we're, 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 we play the cards that we're dealt. OK, so any other questions on this chart? All right. So when we look at, um, so kind of the revenue uh, here, unrestricted revenue, these are some numbers. Uh, enrollment, 11,542. Uh, our unduplicated count, 60.71. Again, our funded, AD, our funded ADA is higher than our enrollment for next year. Uh, the statutory COLA is 7.58%. This shows how much money we receive for lottery. And um, increase per ADA per student uh, is about $12,454 a student. So on the next one, let's, let's take a look at expenditure. Yes? So let's take a look at uh, expenditures. We'll show you the numbers first, and then we'll kind of explain what's happened. Um, certificated salaries are going up next year, about 850,000. Classified salaries, 480,000. Employee benefits, which is are the pensions and the health costs, that goes up about $1.93 million a year. Um, books and supplies, we were able to transfer some funds to some restricted funds for next year, which we're able to reduce that. Uh, money, um, services and other operating expenses, utilities, that's up next year, about a million dollars. And so overall, spending is about 3.22% higher for next year. Where does that, all that come from? Um, it's when you see for certificated salaries, you see an increase of $850,000. There's pluses and minuses. That's the total. That's the net amount on that previous slide. But for all groups, step and column um, increases, we have about $1.1 million. This is not, it's been previously negotiated. We have salary schedules. And based on that, as, as we progress year to year, uh, our employees are um, compensated for their additional time here. Um, health and welfare has gone up a million dollars. Stirs and PERS, about 58,000. Staff attrition. Uh, when our enrollment is down, so uh, we are funding about 10 and a half teachers less next year based on enrollment, um, and that saves, that's a, about $1.2 million. Our special ed contribution is going up. Our routine repair and maintenance contribution is also going up of what we're required to do. On the next page, there's a whole list here. Um, we had, this year, we were able to cover some of the RTI coaches and the learning recovery grant. That comes back into the general fund for next year. That's $2 million. The next four lines deal with COVID. These are expenses. Our remaining COVID funds picked up this year. The COVID funds have all been spent. And so now to continue those programs or to continue what we were paying out of COVID, 
that comes back to the general fund. Um, you'll see on there the resource officer, that's a new expenditure. We put that in the budget. Um, if it's not approved, it comes out of the budget. So it is included in the budget of $135,000. Reduction of two assistant principals, that's done through attrition. Uh, we had hired some additional ones last year and through attrition, so the two assistant principals, we're not uh, replacing those. We were able to charge some of the arts teachers and TOSAs to some restricted funds. We've reduced uh, subcustodians, 309,000. We're reducing some of our maintenance projects, which is going to, um, we're gonna feel that, but we're, that's one of the reasons why the board is exploring a school bond to bring in additional funds uh, for our facilities. And then five years ago, uh, Dr. Hammond and I arrived, we did a PARS, uh, early retirement incentive, and the first one is finally fallen off, so we don't have to pay $354,000 a year. The amount of money that we paid for five years, uh, almost less than $2 million, we received more in savings than we paid out. Uh, we still have, um, Damien, I believe we have one PARS still going. We have one PARS that uh, has two more years to go. And so when you put all of that together, it shows that next year, yes, we are receiving more money. We have more expenditures, though. We're showing um, a surplus of $220,000. Now, remember I talked about the carryover. That $220,000 doesn't include the anticipated carryover we're going to have from this year of about $2.34 million, which when that goes in, it would then be, uh, it'd be a negative number. It would be a deficit but we never put that in at, at, at budget time. So we're projecting uh, for the budget for next year a surplus of $220,000. So with that, we don't know exactly. Uh, you, why, why wouldn't we put the carryover in? We don't know exactly what it's going to be. Uh, when we put this budget together, we actually did it a couple weeks ago. Spending takes place all the way up to, I mean, could it be done? Could people spend the money? It, it could. So, yeah. Any questions on next year's budget before I move on to the uh, two out years? Have you had conversations with When you have contributions of uh, 25.55, now what, what does contributions mean? What our public gives us or what are contributions? I wish our public gave us 25 million. That would be <laughs> awesome. I was uh, thinking we were doing a great job. <laughs> so what happens is uh, we are not fully funded for certain, in certain areas. Maintenance is one. Um, special education is a huge one. Also, um, transportation is another one. And so anything that's not covered by those restricted funds that comes in has to come from the unrestricted funds. Okay, so that, that's what the contribution is the contributions, from unrestricted. Right. And our contributions have been increasing, special ed, uh, transportation, maintenance. Our costs have been going up. We got a little relief this year with the transportation. But the costs have been going up, but the funding has not been going up. And so the contribution keeps going up. Could I ask a big favor that in the future you actually say contribution from other sources? So contributions, so listing things like transportation, special education. If you just said other sources, I'd understand what you're talking about. Okay. Well, contribution to, to, contributions to, to uh, restricted funds that are underfunded. Right. Because so people don't think that the contributions were receiving $25 million in contributions. But we can hope. That's a great strategy for contributions. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Can I ask a very quick question? Sure. Um, can you go back to the slide? I think it's the slide 20. I'm, I'm curious as to why they are. Um, I am. Asking about the reduction of the two assistant principals, and I'm curious as to who makes those decisions about 
the staffing of assistant principals and why we would not replace those assistant principals? Dr. Hammond, would you like to cover that one? Yes, coming out of COVID, we knew that there were additional concerns, uh, especially at our junior high school K-8 levels regarding student behavior, students adjusting to being back to school in person. And as a, a result, we intentionally increased staffing for assistant principals at those schools. Uh, now that we have students who have been back in school for a longer period of time, uh, when those positions, uh, folks moved on, they were promoted to other positions, et cetera. When those positions became vacant, we did not refill them. So it was a, an intentional strategy, and when we hired the additional ones, we hired them with the intention of knowing we have attrition that happens on an annual basis and that we wouldn't have refilled them at that point. And we hired them using COVID funds, which were one-time funds. And when the one-time funds go away, then we have to look at the, those expenditures. I think that, it's, for me, it brings up some of these questions of how do we, which do we incorporate and keep now that COVID funds are ended, right? Because we have spent our COVID funds. And I mean, I've seen the benefits of our assistant principals. I think they take a huge burden off of our principals. They deal with behavioral issues, which are still <laughs> not solved, right? Um, they deal with IEPs and planning and just really make a big difference on our campuses. So I think as a board, that's something I would like us to think about is, I know we can't spend all the money, but how, do, you know, whether we're gonna prioritize, keep, you know, I know those two principles have gone away, but re maintaining or reintroducing that position, I think is a question I have. And then as well as, um, you know, My Connect Academy is another one that has been funded out of COVID funds. We, I think we need to, to look at, does it make sense to keep it? And does the ADA that we receive from the students that attend, you know, pay for it? Can we make that function going forward? It's just something I think we need to consider as we, move ahead and obviously on the same slide is this issue of um, $135,000 for you know a school resource officer which comes at the cost of maybe an assistant principal if, if that's you know the cost and the reduction of two assistant principals at $340,000 if you added that to our surplus with the new expenditure of the resource officer that would actually cover the two assistant principals practically no 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 Thank you. 135 and 340. Is it possible to kind of, can we get through the <laughs> and presentation? The questions. Thanks. Dr. Colgan, one comment, one question. Um, the comment is, uh, I think, from the greater participation and questions. Uh, Damien, thank you so much for the layout of all of this. It's really wonderful. I was going to thank Damien. Balloons were going to fall out of the <laughs> ceiling, Sorry. but it, I, we should thank I, I missed the memo on that. <laughs> um, so much of funding uh, for a district or government is so unlike funding for a home, like a, mm -hmm. a household, I mean to say. But Dr. Colin, a few years ago during one of these presentations, when interest rates were historically low, I believe that there were some questions from the board and we locked in some savings by refinancing. Now that uh, interest rates are higher than they've been in a really long time, you mentioned something earlier about some interest in accounts that uh, we earned. Um, can we, are, is there a portion of funds that we're eligible to shop around right now before the interest rates drop? Um, and lock up the money? Well, just for a short term. Right, uh, I would, can you do that, you know, we can, we can work with the county to see. Um, it's it's already put into a, a pooled thing, but to take those funds and to um, to lock them up with uh, would not be the recommendation because if if the the state comes up short on revenue, see the state will balance their budget, and the way that they'll balance their budget is if they're supposed to pass thirty million dollars onto us next year, they'll say we're going to pay you on July first and we won't pay you on June 30th, which means we'll have to use our money to pay payroll. I don't think our employees are gonna say, yeah, pay me next year. And so the recommendation would be to not lock up that money right now. We don't have a huge amount of money to, to do that. Uh, but uh, I, have a, um, I have a CBO meeting tomorrow with the county, and I can definitely ask them there about that question. Are there any districts that are doing that? Is that a, and then I can report back to the board on that. Thank you. Always looking for more money. I love that. That's good. <laughs> okay. Let's go to kind of the out years and some of the assumptions that we use. We use a calculator to figure out the funded uh, ADA. Enrollment, we're projecting it to be actually kind of flat 
for those out years. Um, things have slowed down. We are picking up some more uh, TKs, which helps out. The statutory COLAs, that we don't get to pick that number. That's provided to us 3.94% and 3.29% over the next two years. We put that in. If it comes in higher, that means more money. If it comes in lower, less money. Uh, our unduplicated <laughs> count, we're going to go conservative on that. Um, we think our three-year average will be 60.77% uh, and 60.99%. We've got a great campaign for next year to make sure we identify every student that it, it qualifies uh, for that, that bracket. And so um, my, my hope is that we'll have a higher number, but for uh, purposes of this budget, I don't, I don't feel comfortable putting in the higher one. We'll know, we will know at first interim what that number is. Uh, lottery per ADA, pretty flat, $237, and then you can see that the uh, dollar amounts, because of the COLAs that we're receiving per student, uh, does go up. And some other things in the out years, we still have step in columns for certificated and classified every year. And health, we have our health caps, uh, we're maintaining those for the next two years. STRS and PERS will go up slightly. and. We also budget for consumer price index, which in the last couple years was much higher than 3%. So the good news is that's coming down. And um, so it's important to know that even though we receive, say, on the base 3.99%, then these are the funds that come out, uh, that these are the expenses that then start to whittle away at that. It's why next year we're showing a surplus of $200,000 when we received an additional $7 million. So that's kind of how the numbers uh, work out. Um, the multi-year, you'll see here uh, beginning balance, revenue expenditures, and estimated ending balance. We're estimating uh, that we will have a slight increase surplus next year. We'll end at $22.9 million, but because of 24-25 and 25-26, where there's a deficit of six million and five million respectively, then the projected ending balance will go down to uh, $11.08 million, which represents about 5.61% of, uh, that's our reserve. And of Damien, that, I don't like these numbers. Uh, let me get some new ones. Uh, you can order Thank some you. new ones, I know. They, I'm not happy. They are a little daunting. I will tell you though, that I, I ran something, and it's kind of been, it's interesting. When we did this, we were in the other boardroom in 20, when we adopted the 2020-21 budget. And it was three months after, it was two months after COVID. And we were projecting that our third year out, we would be at $4.4 .4 million. And then things happened. Now, I'm not saying we base a budget on things are going to happen, but it's not uncommon to see numbers like this. And again, what we do is we, the cabinet and the board, we work together to see if we're not comfortable with that low number, what can we do to, to not have that number go low? Does, does this number reflect some of the backfill that we got from the government because of COVID? So we received over $50 million and we like unlike many other districts, we used the money during COVID because that's right. what it was supposed to be. We, we educated our students, we got them back into school. There are many districts around us that probably still have 30% of their COVID money left because they didn't do the things, the wonderful things that we did. And so many of those things we're still continuing on to do, but it's going to be time to reevaluate those things and say, okay, what are we gonna continue with and what are we going to not continue with? And that's, that's the difficult process that takes place. Okay, thank you. Hmm. So a little historical lesson uh, here or slide kind of shows where our ending balance has been, that we have been on the decline for since 2016-17 uh, where we hit our high, um, but where we were at over $32 million ending balance. It's a good thing we had those funds because COVID hit and we were ready for COVID. And so we're kind of getting back into that territory now where it's, you know, in the teens, million dollars. 
Some of the other district funds worth mentioning is, uh, and some are just basic, student activity fund. This is our, when um, there's contributions at the school sites, donations uh, received from school sites. It's kind of an in and out, what money received and the school spends it on things. Uh, child development is a, a, a paid program. What they receive, they then spend, so you see where they're pretty much where they started. The cafeteria fund, uh, again, revenue is higher. They are doing some things with scratch cooking. I would love to use some of that $9.4 million for some infrastructure, but there are restrictions on that. He can, uh, nutrition services can pay for um, equipment, and but anything behind the walls, the electrical, the, the facilities, he, he can. And so, uh, he has a plan to spin that balance down. That is, uh, I will say that if we do need to, if the state does do deferrals and we have to tap into some money, we can tap into those funds temporarily until the money comes in. So it's not a bad thing to have that money there. And, and there's gonna be a plan for that? I mean, it's not, I mean, he's going to use it for? He has a plan for that, for, for, for purchasing equipment, and also increasing scratch cooking. And part of that plan is with the successful passage of a school bond, which will help with the infrastructures at our schools and the central kitchen. Right. So Did he's- Did you have to need the electrical to be able to set right, up? Right, yeah, he's kind of waiting. He's waiting to, he's packed and ready to go. Let's put it that way. <laughs> he's waiting for uh, more facility money to come in. Uh, speaking of facility money, we started the year with our developer fee fund of about $1 million. That's gone down to $3,800. We used a lot of those funds uh, for the fencing projects that we had at our schools. Same thing with uh, Fund 40. We started the year with $4.3 million. We received a million in 1.4 in uh, redevelopment funds on the revenue side, but spent $5.7 million on fencing and single points of entry. Those are one-time expenditures that needed to be done. Uh, fund 67 is our self-insurance fund. Spent that down a little bit. And so those are the various other funds that you need to be aware of. Next steps is... Are we happy with our self-insurance? Does that still seem to be uh, economically great? Right. For work, yes. So say for workers' comp, we're self-insured for workers' compensation. We have excess liability insurance for things over a million dollars. We do pay for that. Uh, but all in all, our self-insurance on property and liability and, and workers' comp is, uh, well, self-insured on the workers' comp. We, we buy liability insurance, but uh, it's been pretty successful. Thank I will you. say that uh, we have some of the lowest workers' comp rates compared to other school districts. Um, I know Lori uh, Bruneau has done an outstanding job with the workers' comp program and Dr. Hammett working with that. And I think, it's, uh, I think it's a testament to how our staff feels about working in the district. They, they are happy to, to be here. They're healthy and we have very low, we could be paying a lot more in workers' comp rates than we are, so that's good news. Um, so the board is required to take action on this by the 30th. We'll be back next week based on any kind of changes that you wanna make here. Um, we will come back on the 20th and the board will approve the budget. Again, it's a budget, it's a living document. It, it changes. And so we then come back uh, on audit actuals, first interim, second interim, and then it, the cycle repeats. Uh, before I take any questions, I do wanna thank uh, Damien, uh, just Ibarra. This was his first budget and putting it together and the hours and that he worked on this and Joanne DeClaro and the staff I mean, it's, it's amazing. You probably won't see them for about three weeks. <laughs> uh, they're gonna go sleep. After, after June 20th. Uh, after June 20th, yes, yes, yes. So thank, thank you. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Or I'll attempt to answer your questions. Any questions or comments from the board at this time? Do we feel that our um, our maintenance projects are being diminished, or as much as we're fixing things, 
are we gaining a greater number of need? So we, we kind of have a history over the last few years that we've been spending anywhere from three and a half million to five and a half million, just let's not even include the fencing, on some projects. Um, we're required to spend uh, $6 million of our budget needs to go for routine restricted maintenance. Of that, half of that goes for uh, our maintenance salaries, uh, our grounds. The other half leaves us about $3 million. So the amount of projects that we have budgeted for next year, we don't have any major fields that we're repairing. The projects and that we're doing are things like asphalt repairs, things that are safety hazards, things that we need to do, not necessarily that we want to do. And so you will see a reduction in projects, which is going to, uh, we won't be replacing as many um, classrooms with carpeting. Uh, some, you know, we, we've got to, if this was a vehicle, we've got to drive it a little bit longer than trading it in for a new one. So our expenses, our projected needs are growing faster than what we can keep up with? Our need is growing faster than uh, the revenue coming in for it, correct? Which is the reason why the board is looking at um, possibility of a school bond in the future as a way to fund that, which typically that's what school districts do is fund these projects because of the amount need. We probably have over $400 million in, in needs at our schools that needs to take, it's going to need to happen. I don't, I don't know school, I don't know buildings that get better with age, mm -hmm. not like wine. D Jeremy? Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> the people. Uh, and I know you're working on the facility, the facility master plan, mm -hmm. and do we have a date on when that? That's a great question. So he's working on that. Um, it's probably going to be in mid-September. Uh, might even be a little bit late September, first one in October, because I know it's important that we see what our need is. Mm -hmm. I have a pretty good idea what it is. I know it's going to be there. Um, we want to get some input from parents and from students. We weren't able to get a survey out to them um, before school ended. Had some things going on, but we're going to do that when they come back in, in August. And uh, Dr. Plecka and the architect have made a video. and We're going to send that out to all of our families. We want to hear from them. What are the things that they would like to see? And then we will incorporate that into the facility master plan. So that's why there's a little bit of a delay on that. But it will still provide the board enough time to look at that should the board decide they want to move forward sooner than later with a school bond in 2024. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Koblen? I think, I mean, this is my first time doing a, a new year budget, but I think it, the kind of bottom line for me is we have to start thinking about restrictions, tightening our belts, right? And, making decisions that are going to be hard because it looks like we at least have, I mean, we're, we're in a $6 million deficit spending this year. So that we don't want to be doing that. Will you also find out if you're going to your CBO meeting, or def will they talk about deferrals or in the potential of any deferrals? Uh, yes. And we've, we made it really clear that if the governor is thinking about cutting us or doing a deferral, we'll take a deferral. Uh, than a cut, because when they cut us, it's kind of hard to get that back. Uh, they'll give us updates on that. Again, I don't expect we're going to know that until November. Right. right. I, I did have the opportunity on a couple of occasions to sit in on or to participate in some legislative calls um, and conveyed that same message mm -hmm. that, you know, if they're going to make cuts, don't make cuts, just, you know, we'd rather have a deferral if need be. Mm -hmm. You know, and don't fund any new programs. Try and finish the ones that you've promised. So we try to uh, make our voices heard. So, uh, Is the federal government talking about cuts in things like special ed? They seem to always like that. Um, we had, from last year, we had a reduction. I think it was about 400000 in our Title I. And so for next year, we, we budget about 95% because we never really know. Uh, I haven't 95 heard anything special Ninety-five percent of eleven percent. No, five percent of I want to say, Dan, was it two point eight million dollars last year? This year's about two point four million. So what we do is for next year we say we're going to receive ninety-five percent of two point four million. Slight decrease for Title One. 
So they're supposed to give us 11%, right? Is that correct, Amy? Uh, no, we received, this year we received a $400,000 reduction, which equates to like 14%. Okay, thank that's what I didn't understand. In special ed, really the funding has been level, Good. Uh, but our expenses are increasing. So the, fed, the feds are not keeping up with, with the expenses. With their side. Thank you. I wish they would. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right, seeing no additional comments, I now declare the public hearing on our budget, proposed budget closed at 8.22 p.m. All right, since we did go out of order, um, do I have a motion to? Sure. <laughs> almost, <laughs> Trustee Berryman, almost. How about we approve the minutes from May 16th, 2023? May I have a motion to approve? Um, I move to approve the minutes from the May 16th, 2020. I, I did submit a little change. Did you get that, Anna? Oh. Oh, for the next one. Thank you. Okay. I'll so we'll still approve today the, the May 16th minutes as amended. as amended or? Presented, I think. As presented? Yeah, as presented in the middle. Okay, so no need to change the motion from Trustee Talavera. Do we have I'll a second? second? Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, seeing no, uh, uh, the move, uh, I'm sorry, the motion carries. <clears throat> we already did section six where we approved changes to the agenda, but did we do a vote? Well, we never really approved the agenda. Well, do I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended tonight? <laughs> I move to approve the amendment as amended. Thank you, Trustee Berryman. I'll second. second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, the motion carries 5-0. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, since it's already moved around. So, you know, we, we were going to do our um, typical comments. I was on a, I was a minutes taker on a board many years ago. And we called it the good of the order when we, when we finished a meeting. And so everybody sort of did their reports, things that they were really happy about, and it was a way to end a meeting on a positive note. Okay. Would anybody like to join me in maybe having a good of the order um, as part of our, our reports? I so move. Oh, thank you. Moved um, by Trustee Sugarman. Do we have a second? Wait, explain what... So basically, our reports that we'll we would do. Good. Board reports. Yes, just the board reports, uh -huh. because we're still going to do our. Um, consent. Well, we're going to do consent in just a moment. We're going to do our administrative reports. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. We have a couple of. We're things going to do to the information vote. from the board of trustees is going to maybe go last and okay. go, good. At go the end as, of the night. as um, <laughs> as a good of the order. Anybody okay with that? Are you for tonight? Is that a vote? Yes. Is that for tonight? tonight? Just for tonight. For tonight, oh. I, I, I'm fine with that. All right, great. In that case, okay, we have our minutes approved. Do, we, do I have a motion to approve our consent agenda tonight? Is there um, anything that anybody I, would like to pull or discuss? I would like to, of course, discuss our gifts, which I wish were a million something. <laughs> Okay, but there, there are a couple interesting things on our gifts tonight. And Maple PTA gave $10,000. I want to commend them because their commitment to the education of their student is so important for the success of their student and students. And I'm so proud of them for digging deep and supporting their students. So a special raw for Maple School PTA. All right. And um, the second thing is Golden Hills PTA and their foundation, the gifts that they gave, which were very generous, reflect the uh, focus of their school. And that's really important as, as, as we fund LCAP and it, it reflects the goals of our board, that they should reflect the goals of their school and be very specific in what they donated, where it went. 
I want to commend the PTA and the foundation of Golden Hill School, generous Fullerton Rotary, and that the Fullerton Education Foundation gave money for Fullerton Fast and STEAM. Those groups of uh, donations were significant in this particular uh, gifting, and I personally appreciate them all and approve so much of how they really think about the education of our students. It's so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Any other items to be discussed or pulled from the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, do we have a motion to approve? I consent? did. Oh, sorry, do we have you a second? You just need a second. I'll second. second. All right, moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, the motion carries 5-0. Thank you. from our associations tonight thank you if we do for waiting this long into the meeting we do we didn't we do not have a report tonight from any of the associations They're all all right. on break. well thank you Happy summer. <laughs> in, in that case dr. Hammett how about we um, move to section 8 or what was section 8 discussion <laughs> action items mm -hmm. the superintendent's order is gonna be at the end too yes We'll move that to the good of the order. <laughs> so our first item this evening is the approve the revised board policy 6158 on independent study. This was take, brought to the board at the last meeting for a first reading and uh, we need to have these changes made, th this change, one change made to this board policy in order for our compliance uh, with the independent study laws. I move that we accept the, uh, the board policy 6158 as now presented to us. Thank you, Trustee Sugarman. We have a motion to approve. Um, if we have a second, I'll ask if there's any discussion and then we can vote on it. Is there a second to approve uh, item A? I will second it. Moved and seconded. Was there any uh, trustee that would like to discuss this matter further? Mm -hmm. All we've, right. we've seen this policy a few times. It's just very small changes throughout the year. Right? Mm -hmm. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Five zero. the motion carries, thank you. I, I did want to comment that I'm pleased that our school district hasn't given up on independent study, that for some families that's very important, and I'm glad that you're on top of it to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hammett. Item B? Right, okay. Yay. Well, we all have uh, a draft of these board goals here. Um, is there any discussion? Uh, seeing Have you it ever seen these people? here <laughs> with the preamble and all of the edits, I feel that this is personally a very solid document that's forward looking um, and is going to help us be a better district. And it's all on one page. <laughs> exactly. Anna, did you have to mess with the margins a little bit? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> character spacing. When I had to get to certain page numbers, it was all about character spacing. <laughs> um, any other questions or comments about our annual goals? I, or our board goals, rather? I would like to say how I appreciate the fact that we were all able to talk about this and really um, dive deep into it and think about it and be thoughtful on where we want to address and how we want to move forward as a, as a board and what we're looking at doing. And it is exciting that you know we're, we're moving forward and I am um, appreciative of the preamble and, and being able to uh, have this incorporated into all of our goals. So thank you. Thank you for everybody's hard work and um, collaboration mm -hmm. on um, making this something we can all stand behind. You know, while this is our board goals, which is really goals of the five of us and input from the superintendent and the assistant superintendents, I hope that these five goals reflect what our staff likes and believes mm -hmm. and our community because while it's our goals, mm -hmm. we want it 
to be inclusionary of everybody, and I just wanted to make sure we said that so they knew that we were not um, self-serving, that we really tried to consider everybody when we did this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. thank you. That's what we're elected to do, right? Mm -hmm. Represent our community. I feel good about these. All right. Well, yeah, I think we did a great job. If there's a motion <laughs> to approve. <laughs> well, that is. I move that we approve the revised board goals for the 2023-2024 school year. Is there a second? I'll second that. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. The motion carries 5-0. So we're now on to item C, which is approve the sunshine of the Fullerton School District's 2023-2024 proposal to negotiate with the Fullerton Elementary Teachers Association. Getting prepared for negotiations each year with each of our associations is a two-step process. Step one was done at the last board meeting where the items are sunshined and allows the public a chance to review our initial proposals and come to this meeting and provide any comment if they would like. And then the second step is for the board to approve um, our initial proposals, which would allow us to enter into negotiations with uh, each of our associations, and in the case of this board item with FETA. Thank you, Dr. Hammett. Any questions or comments at this point from the board? I move to approve the Sunshine of the Fullerton School District's 2023-2024 proposal to negotiate with Fullerton Elementary Teachers Association. I second and hope that you do uh, a fair and equitable job for both sides. All right, moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. The motion carries 5-0. All right, and item D is approved sunshine for, of the Fullerton School District's 2023-2024 proposal to negotiate with the California School Employees Association, Chapter 130. This is the same item, but related to our CSEA Classified Employee Association. Any questions or comments from the board at this time? I move that we accept this and that we work congenially and well with our classified employees. We have a motion. Do we have a second, please? I'll second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. The motion carries 5-0. Item E is approve our declaration of need for fully qualified educators for the 2023-2024 school year. As you've heard uh, in the news, there is a teacher shortage, especially in certain subject matter areas, as we look at educators in the areas of special education, as we look at uh, educators who are speech and language pathologists, educators who uh, maybe have single subject, subject credentials. So every year we have to, prior to the start of the new school year, estimate for the state, do we anticipate bringing in somebody that doesn't have a full credential? Meaning they do have the educational requirements to get a preliminary um, or an intern status credential, but that they are not fully credentialed with a, what the state would call a preliminary credential. So we prepare this annually and we have anticipated some needs perhaps into sing some single subject areas mm -hmm or some areas of special education. And um, we ask that the board prove this so that we're able to, if we need to, if we can't find a fully credentialed teacher, hire teachers in those subject areas who are not yet fully credentialed. Can you explain what's the expectation for the time a period where they would then become credentialed? They, they have a one year period okay. um, in order to complete that unless they're in an intern program. Mm -hmm. Some of the intern programs can extend to two years, okay. but the, the, the expectation is that within one year, they will be able to complete their credential and get a preliminary credential. And if they don't? Then we go out and we, we search again for, okay. for another individual. Okay. And can you explain the first bullet point here, classroom teachers to meet authorization of instruction to limited English proficient students per Williams lawsuit in school ranked in de decile in group three? Yes, that's actually, that's old language, um, yeah. but, but unfortunately it's still in the code. Mm -hmm. It used to be back in the days of um, the our, ESSR, our, whatever. Yeah, NCOB, Williams. No Child Left Behind, the mm -hmm. schools were ranked in deciles one through three, mm -hmm. and that teachers had to have credentialing. They still have to mm -hmm. have a CLAD credential, which allows them to teach English learners. So okay. that is still a requirement. Um, it's just that we no longer have 
schools that are ranked in deciles one one through three. That's that's old language, but unfortunately, it's still part of the language. So how does that translate into our expectations for teachers it, now? It really uh, translates into we expect all teachers to at least have one English learner in their classroom uh -huh. to have a CLAD credential, which gives them uh, strategies, techniques, pedagogy, and how they're to work with English learners and support the English learners in their classrooms. Do all of our schools have English learners in a classroom? Uh, actually, yes, every school in the district every has single English. School. So all of our teachers mm -hmm. uh, do have a CLAD credential. Okay. Uh, we are 100% with that. Sometimes we do get an out-of-state candidate mm -hmm. who's looking to transition their credential, and they may come in without it, but they have one year, and one year period of time in which they need to complete that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board on this item? No. Um, is there a motion to approve? I move to approve the declaration of need for fully qualified educators for the 2023-2024 school year. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. The motion carries 5-0. Our next item is item F, which is approve new committee on assignment recommendations for the 2023-2024 school year at each of our schools we have teachers who are who are qualified and have the abilities to teach primarily elective courses which all of these are especially at our k-8 schools where we don't have as many staff members we want to offer a wide range of electives but we need to we don't have teachers who can hold perhaps two three or four multiple credentials to teach those areas mm -hmm. so what this process does is it allows teachers who are qualified to teach these, these elective courses to be able to teach them with the board's authorization to have them teach under what's called this committee on assignment. So they don't have the credentials in that subject matter area, but they're, they've done the research to be able to teach the class. They've done the research, and actually all of the folks we're bringing tonight have taught these courses in the past as well. Somewhere else? Uh, actually here, oh, here in our oh. district. Oh, okay. we, just, we, we have to bring them back annually for renewal. Got it. And they've all taught them before. Okay. I shall move. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? I'll, se I'll second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Is that four or one? No, aye. Aye. Oh, I, I, read, I read through the list. It's okay. good. <laughs> uh, five zero. The motion carries. Thank you. I'm excited about some of the classes our kids are going to get to take. Yes. We yes. Many I great electives. You. Our next item is item G, approved new just job description for chief academic officer. Um, for those of you who, who oh, all of you know, um, our associate superintendent, Julian Lee, uh, is going to be the new superintendent at the Buena Park School District. Um, in the interim, as we do a process of running a recruitment and seeking a replacement for that position, uh, we want to make sure that we continue the great work that our educational services department does. And that could be accomplished through approving a new job description, which would be the chief academic officer. It's a position uh, structurally that sits between an assistant superintendent and a director and provides oversight and, and guidance to the educational services department. Any questions or comments from the board on this item? Well, I just wanted to clarify, I know I sent an email to you, but we're approving this position but the expectation is it's held by two folks temporarily in we, the interim as we wait for the associate superintendent or assistant superintendent. And we'll be making vote. recommendations for that at our next meeting. The first okay. step we wanted to do was get the job description approved and then we'll be make, making recommendations to the board uh, regarding how we fill that at our next okay. uh, meeting. I, ap I appreciate the detailed information you gave us regarding mm -hmm. this. It was well, thought out, well planned, mm -hmm. as you guys usually do. And I hope that it gives parents reassurance that things are gonna continue in a wonderful way for the time being as it is. I move that we um, accept this new job description. Do we have a second? Can I just add one more thing um, in comments? I, I really like that we are within this job description is a clear responsibility of diversity, equity, inclusion. I think what we've seen is that position has 
primarily been the responsibility of the consultant until more recently. I know our staff were also working on it, but I like to see that strongly in this position. I really want it. I hope that as we rethink the way this department functions, that that continues to be a strong part of the role of the of, um, Ed Services. And we, especially as we think about you know the new, I know we've been looking for someone for English language development and that role, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to focus on serving especially our English language learners and our bilingual students. So I love seeing that strong emphasis in this, in this role and the way that they will provide leadership over that going forward. Thank you. Um, we have a motion from Trustee Sugarman. And we have a second? We have a second. second. From Trustee Berryman. OK. If there's no further comments, all those in favor say aye. 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 Great. The motion carries 5-0. Right, so we're on to administrative report. Sorry, it's been a bad show tonight. Um, first administrative report is a first reading of revised board policy 5145.12. This uh, is a board policy related to uh, student search and seizures. This is just a first reading. Um, we, as we look at our board policy, as we periodically do, we found that this one was out of date um, as it did not have the most recent recommendations from CSBA that they have uh, requested that, that recommended to districts that have added. So we recommend the board to look at that. Please provide us with any comments, uh, feedback, input that you have, and we can make some adjustments to that as needed. But the adjustments made really had to do with some legal things that needed to be in there. Correct. And, yes. and especially uh, related to electronics and, and those sorts of devices which mm -hmm. weren't even included in our old mm -hmm. policy. Probably so weren't invented. Should we assume that the, I think it was bolded black input was new? Right? The, bold, the black, yes. Mm -hmm. so, so as mm -hmm. far as um, the, the notation on that, yeah. anything that's struck through our, is the old Perfect. language that's no longer yeah. recommended by CSBA. Uh -huh. Everything that's dark bolded mm -hmm. is, are the new ads that are recommended. And the policy okay. we adopted from CSBA as they recommended it. Yeah. I had a question because I, I wish I had printed it with me but, and brought it with me, but it seemed like the updated language was much, um, kind of put an emphasis on the burden of proof, that you don't search just at random. You actually have to have some kind of reason to suspect there's a need to do this, yeah. you know, whether it's- In good in faith and believes good, emergency involving yeah, danger. Yeah, yeah. You smell a little marijuana, you, a child reports there's something dangerous, you you check. Whereas the the kind of locker situation and the desk, it's the sec, the kind of second half of it was, and we can do locker checks any time we want, sort of without kind of an impetus or reason behind it necessarily. And I understand the need to, you know, this is school property and the need to kind of have the ability um, and maybe it's a generalized threat that we're concerned about and so we want that, that freedom. But I, I guess I was kind of thinking that they were two different approaches and they didn't necessarily reconcile to me the logic behind one that was much more evidence-based you know there's a some kind of evidence of need to search versus sort of um, yeah there didn't seem to be a lot of necessary burden of proof to then permit um, locker searches and, and desk searches and I think it's a clarification one of the things that is very important in all search cases with uh, administrators uh, doing searches mm -hmm. whether that's of a student's backpack or whether that's a locker or a desk mm -hmm. is this idea of reasonable suspicion. Mm -hmm. There does have to does have to be a reason okay. as to why the administrator would want to look in a desk or a locker or search in a backpack yeah. um, because there is a reasonable suspicion that okay. there could be something that there that could harm the student or harm somebody else. Mm -hmm. And there's that that threshold that needs to okay. be met every time. It may also be expectation of privacy. <coughs> mm -hmm. We're school property or school um, spaces, you know, you wouldn't expect to have privacy, but your person or your, your backpack, backpack do. or your phone, that, that might be a, a higher mm -hmm. standard, but mm. I'm not sure. Yeah. Any Was other it questions? necessarily oh, against it, I just, it, it didn't make as much logical, s consistent sense to me. Yeah. There, w there wasn't any, there's nothing that says with, re you know, it, it, it pretty much just says that you, at any time, you can conduct a survey, you know, an inspection. It right, doesn't say that, upon reasonable, you know, circumstances or. Yeah. And I think the other why. point, as Arun mentioned, yeah. uh, 
is that the that search can also be done with or without a student being present. So there are times that you know you there's a smell coming out of a locker, the student is not there, um, mm -hmm. but that that's that search still has to be done or, or whatever needs to happen at, at that time. The we policy says that students would stand by their desks or lockers. With students standing by their assigned lockers or desks. Right. If, right. if they're present. That's right. if so they're present. We could look at that language and see about adding the, the Yeah, I would clarify that. Suspicion. Like they don't have to be there and then and and or for your look if for the safety if someone's yeah looking for something yeah. and it's maybe not one particular student but it's like the tip was it's yeah. somewhere at school and yeah. we just have to search all the lockers whether you give us consent or exactly. not or if it's specific to you mm -hmm. you know we're still looking for some for mm -hmm. whatever reason yeah but that would be a, le a legitimate reason to search yeah. lockers if someone said there's a gun in a locker I don't know which one yeah, yeah which right? one but it, yeah. it's somewhere it's somewhere here and yeah. we just have it and search them all and not, you know, one particular student yeah. or, yeah. So I, th I think that's that's another reason why I feel like, and in a sense it's, you know, school property mm -hmm. that's being, so um, one of the things that I think about is like, um, like some of the policies that we have with like iPads, right? Like mm -hmm. y you're being a good steward of using the iPad, mm -hmm. you know, the way you're supposed to. And, you know, you're supposed to use the lockers or school property to, the reason why you know you're using it in a sense yeah and yeah. then if it's not being used that way we can search and look mm -hmm. you know for whatever yeah and great news about the Fullerton School District is we have very few lockers yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's that one of the things that. that's very helpful but they can't search their desk right yeah. yeah and we don't uh, that's one of the disadvantages <laughs> of being of, at a k-12 or high school district mm -hmm. is you have many more lockers mm -hmm. I did have one specific question. There's, it seems like language that was maybe left over from a previous policy because it says we can inspect student vehicles. Our kids don't drive, so then it begs the question: like, are we inspecting parent vehicles? Is that older brother, older sister? I mean, yeah, we're, we're 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 not able to inspect parent vehicles. That would have to be a, a function of law enforcement. Yeah. Um, so I, I will revisit. It's that currently as well. in the policy right now. Yes. Is a bicycle yeah. a vehicle? It's types. It's student it vehicles could be a, parked it on could district be a bicycle. property. That's a vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. And student vehicles parked on district property. Yeah, and I guess it, it should <laughs> come down to the definition of what is an e-scooter or, zip it up? or an okay. e-bike. Is that considered a vehicle? Okay. We do have, believe it or not, we do have students who ride e-bikes. So that I'll talk a little bit to legal oh, about that. Could be. Could be that. Okay. Maybe and one la I have a question about the, the staff that conduct the ser mm -hmm. searches. Are, are they all principal? Who, who conducts mm -hmm. a search? Administrators, yes. And they are all, they're all trained? They're all trained, yes. They're all trained on searches, and uh, they, they conduct those searches based on training, and we provide them with a step-by-step, -step, this is how it's, it's right. to be conducted. They're never, never conducted alone. Mm -hmm. There's always two adults in the room, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it's done to you know, ensure ensure right. the student's dignity right. and, and protection. Uh, space is protected right. Mm -hmm. And they don't delegate, the principal doesn't delegate a search to anyone uh, else that's absolutely not trained. Not. No, okay. absolutely mm -hmm. not. Even if police are called and involved, the principal still does the search? That's correct, yes. Okay. That's, I like knowing that. Any other questions or comments on this item? All right, this is a first reading, so we will be back on this I would say that this is a really important um, board policy mm -hmm. because it's really important to have in writing for mm -hmm. uh, guardians, parents, whatever, of students mm -hmm. who don't quite understand why the school or how the school has the ability to do this without phoning them. That, and. Um, to have it in writing is really an important thing. Do we, um, would we ever want to have this be part of a student agreement with parents? I don't remember if we, if I've been, ever signed I've off never on something seen it. like this, but. I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember, I mean, we do have quite a few policies in our student hand, our parent mm -hmm. student handbook. Right. I would just need to see if that one is there. I don't remember. But okay. we just I didn't think so. And Chad, while you're looking at this, when you talk, when the one sentence that does, or the two sentences that do say the types of student property that may be searched by school officials include but are not limited, and it adds lockers and desks on here, 
and it's talking about that being student property, but yet on the next page it, it mm -hmm. says that the student lockers and desks the are, contents of those are the school's property. So you might want to take a look at that because it's a little contradictory. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, the content inside might be student property, but yeah. the desks yeah. themselves are FSD. Thank you for that. Any other questions or comments before we move on to the next item? Okay. All right. Next item was the oh. budget. Did no, no, did that already, right? Okay. Uh, that? Just the presentation, <laughs> and then we're down to board member. Rob, you're on. Okay. I got new numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Things have improved. <laughs> You just won the lottery. Better That's contributions. And feature agenda. All right, superintendent's report. Dr. Hammett, it's great to have you sitting here today. Well, thank you so much. Well, tonight I am making comments on behalf of Dr. Pletka. He and Dr. Lee are out of town at a superintendent's conference, and Dr. Pletka was presenting uh, at that conference. So I get to sit in. Um, in the spring of 2023, the Superintendent Student Advisory Committee was initiated, and the committee consisted of student representatives from junior high schools and K-8 schools with Dr. Bob and Dr. Lee and Amy Sotolongo, our PBIS TOSA, uh, running that committee. The objective of this committee was to provide students with voice and participation in their education and in their schools. This was an opportunity to then identify positive aspects of their schools and also any challenges they may perceive on their campuses. The students, through their collaborative meetings with the superintendent and the, and the group, compiled a list of comprehensive positives about their schools. Some things that they mentioned were their teacher's commitment to them and to their education. They also mentioned teacher's social-emotional lessons and lessons provided by school staff regarding social-emotional learning. And they loved sporting activities at their schools. Alongside that, there were some challenges they mentioned, such as bullying, limited lunch time activities, and even though they like sports activities, they felt there were insufficient options. They'd like to see a wider range of sports activities. So the student committee identified some solutions aimed at addressing, addressing one of the identified needs across all the schools. They chose a project, which I found to be very exciting, was they conducted a poster contest at each of their schools. And they ran it with all the students at the school and the district, Dr. Pleka's office, provided them with poster board and art supplies and gave them the ability to focus on promoting kindness and combating bullying. So you'll see under the board members' pictures, we have the winning poster from each of the schools. The student representatives on the committee from each campus have the responsibility of judging the contest, and the winners were rewarded with their choice of either treats or a lunch delivery. Furthermore, Dr. Pletka and Dr. Lee facilitated conversations between the students from each school and their respective principal to present the challenges and potential solutions they developed based upon their particip participation in the committee. So as a result, not only did we have the poster contest, but a facilitated conversation between the representatives of each school and their principals. So it was a great opportunity, and we look forward to more next year. This was only the beginning, and we look forward to this being carried on and then possibly looking at a modified version of this at well, as well that we could conduct at the, the elementary schools. <clears throat> um, also, this was a great end of the year. We had some amazing events, and Dr. Bob, the entire cabinet, wants to thank all of our schools and departments for a great school year. And it was amazing the number of promotion ceremonies. I think we had pre-K, TK, kindergarten, sixth grade, and then of course the highlight, our eighth grade promotion ceremonies. Want to thank Rob and his team for all their work in making sure those promotion ceremonies were set up. Jeremy and his team for us being able to stream those out and uh, have the sound and the video and all of that working flawlessly. Um, and just everyone who put that together to make those eighth grade ceremonies great. I know Aruni and I had a great time together uh, helping celebrate the eighth graders at LV. So ultimately from the bottom of 
our hearts, we want to thank all of our students, teachers, and staff for an amazing 2022-2023 school year. I can't believe we're already saying that. And hard to believe, but before you know it, we're going to be welcoming everyone back for the 2023-2024 school year. Hate to say it, but it's coming quickly. So Dr. Pletka wants to tell, wish everyone a great and relaxing summer. Have great times with your families, and we look forward to seeing you all next year. Thank you very much. Um, Trustee Berryman, would you like to begin tonight's information slash good of the order? Does it have to be good news? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have much. I'm gonna, I am, I'm also gonna um, echo the fact that I thank all of everybody, staff and um, students and parents and everyone for such a good year. Um, again, it was a, it's a rocky, rocky year coming back from COVID. Not, you know, it's still not, we're not back and we still have our challenges. So patience and one step at a time because it's not all going to happen immediately. But knowing that it's, you know, that there are going to be repercussions for a long time that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with. So having everybody be able to pull together to make that happen. Um, staffing, uh, t uh, uh, professional development, everything that went on, so I'm very proud. Uh, I, we got a list of all the summer activities and the calendar on what we're doing, so we're not, it's not over, um, because there are people still having, you know, going to um, pro um, providing programs for our students, um, providing enrichment, providing, you know, opportunities for our kids to uh, excel in things that they might not even know that they can excel in, so um, kudos to our district for uh, engaging our students even past the traditional school year. Um, for our staff, um, it's time for some self-care. Uh, please make sure that you guys are taking care of yourselves. Uh, we There was a lot going on at the end of the year, and that's probably another subject to talk about, but for now, um, <laughs> make sure that you um, take care of yourselves. Uh, take some time uh, to, to decompose and to relax. So that's my that's my report for this evening. Thank you. Thank you very very much. Don't decompose, decompress. <laughs> Trustee Talavera. Um, no, yeah, I wanted to definitely kind of echo, you know, um, about uh, the eighth grade, <laughs> not decomposing, but uh, the eighth grade promotion uh, celebration. So, um, yeah, definitely for me personally, my my eighth grader promoted. Um, so it was a whirlwind to to be up there with him um, and celebrating with all his friends as well too. So, and then again, tons of stuff going on at the end of the school year. Um, but definitely um, want to make sure that we celebrate everyone finishing the school year uh, the way we did. And I was going to share, again, all the amazing programs that we are offering at a lot of our school sites. Um, I'm hoping that the general public is maybe still listening to us, uh, may or may not be. Um, but, yeah, take advantage of, of all the programs that, we, that we're offering um, over the summer, which is – Again, one of those key things um, in continuing education uh, over the summer and, and making sure we mitigate some of that learning loss um, in that. And that's pretty much it for me. Thank you very much. Trustee Hanchett. Hey, sorry, on. I got to go to Nicholas. That was really fun to be involved for my first time. And I love the student speeches to hear the personality of the kids. Um, and then I got to celebrate my own daughter's sixth grade promotion and the celebration of the first DLA inaugural class was really, it was a dance party and it was super fun. So <laughs> really an ex amazing experience and I'm so grateful for that program and to see it grow at the junior high next year. Um, but I'm sure like you all, I've been watching the news, <laughs> um, paying attention. I mean, there was a brawl and arrest at a Glendale school board meeting last week. We got a word from our governor about the issues of banning books and concerns about students' rights to public information and free to speech. And so I've been thinking a lot about this topic and um, 
like the basically, you know, our I feel like last month our community was very civil and they brought their concerns to us about this issue and I've been thinking about um, our role as a board of how we don't want to run from hard topics, you know, and we want to continue to support our kids to have hard conversations. I keep um, thinking about this quote from our families, one of our favorite authors, children's authors, Kate DiCamillo. She wrote, you know, Because of Wind Dixie and Tale of Despero, and she says that the sacred task of telling stories for the young is to ask, how do we tell the truth and make that truth bearable. And I keep coming back to that thinking about how do we enable our teachers to, in developmentally appropriate ways, help our kids carry hard truths. Not shy away from them, but really have important discussions about history and perspectives and experiences. And um, I, so last month after we had our conversations here, I went and I wanted to meet with our Rolling Hills sixth grade teachers because I realized after hearing from our parents and many different perspectives and emails and I hadn't heard from the teachers and I wanted to hear their experience of it um, and what we could do you know, to support them in this work. And it was really helpful for me and I found out, you guys, I just wanna sh say that they really did do the hard work to support their kids. They took their sixth graders to the um, Museum of Tolerance, they listened to the Holocaust survivors, they talked about other forms of genocide and discrimination so that their kids were uh, prepared to have those tough conversations. And, um, and they even talked about not using some of those symbols of hate outside the classroom and the importance of those symbols. So I just, they did what our, we expect our teachers to do. And they helped our kids deal with hard truths. And, my concern that I wanted to bring to y'all is I don't want our teachers to be afraid or discouraged from that work. And I think they need to know that we have their backs and we have some work to do to clarify that process of what it looks like when these hard topics come up. But um, that's where I'm sitting right now as the board is how do, we know, how do we encourage our teachers with all that's happening around the nation and in our community to know that we have their backs and they need to continue to do this important work. Thank you. Trustee Sugarman. I can't believe you've made that statement because guess what? What? I have been thinking the same thing mm. since our last board meeting. Mm. First of all, I want the people who came to our last board meeting to know we listened, we mm -hmm. heard them. Mm -hmm. We did not just sit here as statues and ignore the powerful words they said on some, in so many areas. I would say that more than ever, our families, teachers, principals, and leadership are facing these unbelievable challenging times. Mm -hmm. We are all working to manage a course among competing values mm -hmm. and stakeholders using their personal lenses to view and resolve topics. Mm -hmm which is basically what you've also said. And um, I am happy that people who have issues, whether competing or not, come to us and talk to us then and tonight. And I was especially proud at that meeting that regardless of a person's viewpoint, after the person spoke with dignity, the audience clapped, even if the expression of that person was not to their mindset. I really learned a lot from that meeting, but there's one thing I really want to underscore that you've already said, and that is there were articles written that schools should, and also people who spoke, that schools should take the time to make sure students are aware of what's going on. And yes, indeed, the th teachers at Rolling Hills studied the Holocaust, studied other forms of genocide, took the children to the Holocaust Museum at the Museum of Tolerance, and had a Holocaust survivor come and speak with them I would put that, less, the, that group of lessons up against any school, school doing 
the play, Sound of Music, anywhere, not only in California, probably in the United States, that was a broad and effective lesson plan, and they should be commended, and I feel badly if they took some articles that people um, just did not ask this question of the school or the staff or the administration here as to how that play had been uh, pre-worked on before it was done. And so, yes, indeed, I want to respect those teachers and that staff and that principal. I understand all the other things that were said, believe me, I really understand. And like you, I not only spoke to people at that school, I spoke to young people from all over. I spoke to attorneys because I am totally against censorship, but I am for protection. Children need to face, feel safe at school mm -hmm. and they need to be respected. And I know that our principals heard what was said and I'm proud that our district moves forward in a good way. All of that being said, I do have something wonderful to say at the end of this long meeting. I want you to know that our own J.D. Mancha, who has been recovering from a terrible motorcycle accident, just got married May 20th. He must have missed our last board meeting. I am so happy for him. And Yasenia, did I say that right? Yesenia. I want to congratulate them from me and I'm sure from the entire board and the district and especially the transportation department to say we are so happy for you and may you have many, many wonderful years together. Such wonderful news. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, just keeping it very short, you know, our son who started in kindergarten uh, has finished his time at the Fullerton School District, and um, we're so grateful as a family. Um, everything good that we ever hoped would happen has happened, and I think he's ready for high school now. Um, these board goals are fantastic. Thank you, especially <laughs> to our uh, most recent trustees for their input, their comments. Um, this budget is kind of sad, but we're going to do everything we can as a board um, to try to make up for some of that and convince the community of what we need uh, to make sure that Fullerton School District is and continues to be just the best district that it can be. And I think with that, you know, good night to everybody. Um, wait, wait, wait. Are there any future future additions? additions? Remember, for the October 21st, you can help support Fullerton School District by attending the Fullerton Education Foundation major event. Thank you, Trustee Sugarman. No, but before we <laughs> adjourn, yes, we our next meeting is in one week. Mm -hmm. But are there any other items that any trustees would like to add for future agendas? I wanted to add. To clarify, so last month after we heard the public comments of, from the community, especially regarding controversial issues and decision-making processes, um, I requested and the board agreed that we would review this and we suggested it be when we have our special board meeting on um, uh, board what? protocols. That got moved from September now to first October 3rd. But I wanted to say that it, it turns out we do have lots of policies on these topics. I went through and looked throughout our older policies um, two specifically that I think we should take a look at. Um, the first is called Complaints Concerning Instructional Materials. It is board policy 131, no, 1312.2. It was last revised in 2010. And then the second is the policy of controversial issues, board policy 6144, also last re re revisited or revised in 2010. Um, there are two more that are related, more about curriculum adoption um, and, instruct and piloting instructional materials. They all fit within that 
those categories that the governor and superintendent just said, take a look at these policies. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes perfect sense that under that guidance from the governor, he's given us additional support and materials to do that process, that we at least take these first two in October. Does that make sense to everybody? Under the existing topic or discussion that we have, we're gonna specifically address those two board bylaws? I, I think we should, yeah. I would agree. I think I've asked for the same thing, so I think that we're on the same page. And I don't know when. I mean, it depends on what the October yeah. board meeting looks like, but I leave it up to the administration or the superintendent to, yeah. and the uh, board president to figure out when we can do that, but definitely start to look at those policies, mm -hmm. look at what we have in place and mm -hmm. um, how, we, how we do that, so absolutely. Is that soon enough? Did we want to have something in place or at least a discussion before the school year? We have that much time. Two meetings. Well, we have, really, before the school year, we have one meeting in July. <laughs> no. We have, well, yeah, no. we have two meetings, regular meetings in August, August right? right? But the school year will have been. Will have started. The school year will have started by. Not my fault. August. So we could, <laughs> we could discuss those in July if the board wanted that. But or maybe a first reading. Can we do that? I mean, so they're at least put before our agenda. Would it be okay if we had you send the policies to us with some comments and that we can think about and decide if we need to bring them back? Or, or do a first read, like you said, do a first read in July. First read in July, that, then we could give we input and changes. See it on the uh, yeah. two agendas from now. It, it, yes. and I was gonna ask if there's any other relevant policies that are in there. Mm -hmm. So I know Trustee Hanchet went through some of those, but maybe if if um, Bob wants to go through some of those as yes. well too mm -hmm. and see if there's any. You, know, you also mentioned two other that might yeah. be re relevant. So yeah. just maybe compiling all those that are relevant mm -hmm. um, yes. and ma yeah, maybe just kind of reviewing what those look like. Yeah. Yeah, and, and send those along for for us to take a look at. If we do a first read in July, can we then hold it until for discussion in October? Or do we push the discussion to like August? There's right, there is no time limit from first so reading to want. when you when you bring them back. You could, you could bring them for first it. reading and mm -hmm. and hold them for two two or three meetings if you wanted to bring them back for for more or you could do a discussion item mm -hmm. and discuss them and then bring mm -hmm. them back for approval mm -hmm. if you wanted to do that I in a multi step process. There was definitely urgency on the tool for uh, plays, right? Theater theatrical performances just so that teachers are not planning plays without that guidance. Well, and, well that corresponds also with that c the committee that's been doing the work right now. So mm -hmm. right. So we do have the committee that, that yeah. is working on that to have a process in place. Yeah. So that's kind of an week. urgent need to have it before the school year, whereas this, unless we have other major complaints and <laughs> issues, that mm -hmm. it's more as needed, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there is some space for time. Mm -hmm. Let's do the first read in July. We may have some instructions or some comments that we might want to send to the committee mm -hmm. as a board after reading those yeah. for them to consider as they're doing yeah. their work. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we can hold it for action or discussion mm -hmm. at a later mm -hmm. meeting. Yeah. Is that sufficient, Trustee Anjit? Sounds for, good to me. For the July And I have one more thing. Agenda? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Um, for July, are we are we going to be hearing on s safety and um, kind of like dealing with crisis situations? Yes, we will. We have a safety presentation plan okay. for the July meeting. We do and crisis emergency response. We have that plan. Yes. Great. At some at one point, I had asked Chad, like, are we going to hear this, 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 and this? And he said, bring it before the board to make sure uh, they all agree. So these are the things I was would like to hear at that July meeting. Just information. Um, I would love to hear our progress on the hardening efforts in our schools from fencing and cameras, like who's m monitoring cameras, how we're using some of those efforts that have been put in place in the last year or two. Um, I would like to hear more about the role of the school safety monitors that we have, um, private security use, OC GRIP programs, and any other kind of related partner programs that we use that are meant to increase safety. I would love to hear more of those on the data of our use of poli Fullerton Police Department. I know we get the monthly report, but kind of a big picture of how often and for what type of calls, like how often they're responding to our needs. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yes. and any updates on that, whether that would change or we can expect the same.
kind of response? <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe not. Um, I want to know about our efforts to address gun violence. <laughs> you guys oh, okay? no, no. It's not something unrelated. You I good? Apologize. Okay. Um, efforts to address gun violence, whether that's through staff training, campaigns and awareness with students and families, anon anonymous reporting and tips um, to respond to students in mental health crisis and other concerns about safety that kids might want to report. Um, I'd love to, related to that, move, have a conversation about how we're moving beyond just bullying to harm reduction, self-harm, violence, mental health crisis response, how that relates to our students' safety on campus. Um, I'd like to know if we are monitoring social media accounts that our students use. There are a few that we know are being used to harass and um, create, yeah. Bullying. Is this all Student? one meeting? Uh, wow. I guess it's up to. Oh, it almost sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I think these are all really important it topics. Almost sound, it almost sounds like a special, like a special board meeting, just for the, just for the volume of yeah, items. Yeah, I'm not done yet. I, I um, thought. Yeah, yeah. Aren't we going to? I mean, I thought we were going to do a meeting on, like, safety, internet safety. I thought that was going internet to safety, be. Internet safety, yes. And just, I mean, we had talked about. That was going to be in August, correct, mm -hmm. Jeremy? Well, we've just changed yeah. that date. Yes. What? Well, we haven't changed, but we've canceled August 2nd and 3rd. No, that's, it's that's different. The board, that's the retreat. It's different. Okay. Yeah. Late August. Sorry, can some of that, I mean, yes. some of that would be covered in that. Yeah. So I, guess I think that, I, you know. I, uh, let me, like, make it administrator's be. choice where you want to put the focus right now. I, I want to know all these questions, but maybe you can space it out over the maybe, next couple Maybe you months. could. Let, <laughs> or let we us can work have a with meeting. our teams to, to determine what, what we can present. And yeah. it also comes to a, down to a matter of what's a digestible amount of content yeah. for, for one presentation as yeah. well. So. Uh, maybe if it's, you know, you got physical health, physical safety, you got mental health mm -hmm. safety, mm -hmm. you have cybersecurity safety. Yeah. I mean, there's different pieces. I mean, it all mm -hmm. comes together. You but one maybe we meeting. can like dissect it that way where mm -hmm. maybe there's a, a little bit each time. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds like there's broad agreement to get the data that you're asking for. It's just a matter of uh, streamlining it maybe for staff mm -hmm. to get it to you and the rest of us as well. Right, that'd be the other way we could present some of that. We could have our regular um, safety meeting, address mm -hmm. as many of these we could mm -hmm. within a a reasonable amount of time, mm -hmm. and then provide updates through communique on, yeah. on the other questions. Okay. Was your intention more to focus on physical safety? Our, the, the, the intention is to focus on physical uh -huh. safety and to really then focus on how does that also lend to some of the other areas, for example, bullying, school climate, mm -hmm. those sort of things. But really, the, the primary focus was emergency response, physical safety. Okay. That's okay. how we work with partners, yeah. et cetera. Sounds good. Let's make that the July focus. And I can wait on the online. No, it, it's okay. <laughs> Isn't the online already? It w we can wait on the online until we have our online safety and uh, technology. Because we still need to look at that technology Citizenship policy. in August, right? right. Mm -hmm. Digital right. citizenship. Yes. Yep. Which we were also looking at a board policy at that time, too. We yes. have the, yeah, student use of technology policy to review. Any other requests for future agendas? If I did, I certainly wouldn't give them to you now. <laughs> people would be jumping off a cliff. <laughs> oh, wait. All right. Well, Those are good, if, good topics. If Those there are no topics. other requests awesome. from the board for future items, we'll go ahead and adjourn tonight at 9.20 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Ruthie, thank you for my thank you.